and welcome to the Elastic Seminar, Deep Learning for Environment Monitoring. Uh, thank you all for coming. We have six speakers today. We talk about agricultural monitoring, carbon stock estimation, forestry analysis, and so on. We will cover a deep learning method ranging from attention mechanism to meta learning and repeat supervised learning. I will also take this opportunity to remind you of the ISPRS Congress in Nice next June. Um, this Congress is the largest event of the photogrammetry and remote sensing community and is held for the first time in France in over 90 years. Expect over a thousand paper and 2,500 uh, participants, industrial expos, keynote speakers, forums, a gala dinner, and also tutorials, uh, some of which are presented by myself and also some by uh, uh, some of the speakers today. So if you're interested in going a little bit further uh, than what you hear today, this would be a good opportunity. So remote seminars are nice, but if you miss in-person conferences, uh, that may be of interest to you. Also, re reminders that the submission deadline is soon, is on January 10th, so yeah. Okay, so our first speaker uh, today is Charlotte Pelletier, who has done some very interesting work on time series analysis with uh, deep learning, and will present an overview of the field today. Okay, so now let's start the presentation. So I will talk about time series as well. it was titled. So as you're probably all aware, time series describes the evolution of a process over time and they are everywhere. So in your daily life, for example, with your smartphone, with um, your localization system like GPS, in the food security with spectrograph of, um, of different food types and also in environmental applications that I will talk about today. There is a uh, um, a current trend uh, that it is that the time series are increasing in quantity due to the increase of, of the number of sensors that record uh, time series data. So how it looks for, you know, Earth observation applications. So here I displayed a satellite image time series that I have extracted from Landsat 8 satellite. And so you see that um, over the time, the so we are looking at the same area, but at different time steps. And so you see that the vegetation, the landscapes is evolving during the year. So here it's a bit old, it's 2013, in the, it's in the south of French. But I'm sure that you, you see that, for example, crops are evolving a lot. And this is, I mean, mainly why we are using um, satellite image time series in, in remote sensing application is for the monitoring of vegetation or more generally of landscape, uh, you know, to, to see the evolution of different landscape, to see the changes on, on land cover with land cover being the, the, the type of surface that you see on the image. So for example, a forest, a water and urban areas or a specific type of crop. So here in the presentation, I will focus on uh, one specific application or one specific use of satellite image time series, where in fact, we are not really dealing with images, but we are really dealing with time series data. Uh, so what we are doing currently is for each pixel of the image, so you know that the image is composed of several pixels, and for each pixel, for example here in red or in blue, we extracted the temporal information. So here I display, for example, the NDVI for two different crops, so corn and, and soy, and uh, so NDVI is normalized difference vegetation index and, and allows to show the, um, the growth of the vegetation. So you see the different phase of evolution of, of, of the crops. And by, you know, comparing this time series, we can, okay, probably guess that they are different. And by using some algorithm, we can try to, to define which type of crops we, we have here. So here, okay, I display other examples of corn and soybeans that are two, um, two uh, summer crops. So you see that they are growing at the same period, but there is still a small temporal shift. I also displayed wheat uh, and DVI profiles for different crops. And so you see that here it's very different from corn and soybean because wheat is a winter crops. So the peak of, of growth is at a different time period. And I also displayed a forest, um, a type of forest here the broadleaf tree and so you see that okay the NDVI stays quite constant during the year. 
Okay, so more formally, a time series is a sequence of values that it is ordered in time. It can be either univariate, as the NDVI profile, for example, or multivariate, for example, if we are um, if we are keeping all the spectral bond information. The time series can be possibly of different lengths. This is especially the case in remote sensing applications where you have clouds, where you might have uh, different sensor acquisitions, so different um, temporal grid, temporal support for your time series. So here I just give a brief example univariate time series. So let's say that this is the NDVI that describes uh, the soy crop here. And when we are dealing with time series data, there are many analyses that we can done. Uh, so probably one of the most known is the forecasting uh, times, time series forecast team, where we try to predict the future value of our time series. And this you probably all know about, you know, um, weather forecasting, where from the temperatures of past days, we are trying to guess what will be the the temperature of future days. But I will not talk about forecasting today. I will not talk also about regression and retrieval. I will just focus on time series classification. So what is time series classification? Uh, so the goal here is to associate an unlabeled time series with a class. And for doing this, we will use some label time series. So we are in what we currently call a supervised learning framework. So let's talk about my example here. I have a black um, time series and I want to know if it's a normal earth beat or if it's myocard infection. So to do this, I will train a learning algorithm and hopefully if this learning algorithm is accurate, it will allow me to predict that my unlabeled time series that was in black belongs to the normal earth beat class. So we are doing the same in a remote sensing application with, um, with, uh, with, for example, the crops that I have shown before. So this is for time series classification and uh, for the, the framework of, of time series classification. There are many algorithms that, uh, that are able to solve this problem, but today I will focus on deep learning. So the main question is why uh, learning first? So here, okay, you see that we have dogs, but we have also uh, mop and we have also muffin in, in, on, on, on the right of the screen. So why learning? So we might be good as human, you know, to recognize hopefully the dogs from the mop, even, even if it's not so easy, but uh, we will take a bit of time to do that. So when you want to map, uh, for, let's say, for example, the uh, one whole country, for example, France, it will take a bit of time to label each pixel manually. So human might be a bit good, but okay, first, they sometimes not that good. And they are also quite long for, for, for labeling a uh, huge volume of, of data. So why using specifically deep learning? So you might be aware that Okay, deep learning have, uh, revolution, has revolutionized the field of computer vision, where we obtain some human level performance in image recognition tasks. So here it's, for example, the ImageNet, uh, I mean, um, an extract of ImageNet uh, data. Um, and also deep learning was widely adopted by the natural language processing community, so NLP, and it has improved the state of the art in audio, um, in audio um, applications. And it has also various successes in the field of remote sensing. So here I just, I just uh, display an image of, uh, of the breast crop data set that we build with Mark. And, and okay, so there are many other, you know, successful application, but because I'm focusing on satellite image time series data, I just show this one for, for now. So, um, Okay, for this presentation, I will talk a lot about deep learning. So I just tried to recall a bit here of, um, of prerequisite, I would say, on how works a neuron in a network. So for those who are very unfamiliar with deep learning techniques, I will not go too far in the technical explanation, but okay, this is probably like the unit of, of the of the network is the neuron and the computation is not that much complicated and I'm pretty sure that you have already seen this picture or a similar picture to explain how it works a neuron. In fact, we have inputs that are displayed here in green, so x0, x1 and x2, and we are just simply doing a linear combination with some weights, so w0, w1 and w2, that is the 
the, the linear combination that it is displayed here with the sum, and we add a bias parameters. And then we apply what we call an activation function, and we obtain our output, so y here or z uh, in, in, the display, um, in the display here. And the goal of the deep learning algorithm will be to train and to learn the parameters W and B that best, you know, solve one task. So for example, our time series classification task. One type of network is, um, so one type of very famous network is the MLP, um, the MLP network, where we have the input still in green, and then we have a stack of different um, layers. So here we have several dense layers, and at the end, okay, we have a specific dense layers with a specific uh, activation function, which is a softmax activation function that allows us to output some class probability for our classification task. So if you are dealing with other type of problem like regression or whatever, here the activation function uh, will, will change. But then, okay, this is like the simplest network where all the inputs are connected to all the neuron in the next layer and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now I will dig into three types of architectures that have been uh, widely used for satellite image time series classification, which are the CNN, the RNN, and uh, attention-based uh, attention architectures. And finally, I will draw the conclusion of this uh, presentation. So let's go first into CNN, so convolutional neural networks. So the basic unit of CNN are, uh, is the convolution operator. So here, I, okay, I display the result of a convolution applied to a satellite images. So here we have applied an edge detection filter to our satellite images. And so we see that in black, um, we have the different edges of the image. For time series, it works exactly the same, except that we have one less uh, dimension. And also in uh, CNN, the convolution that we apply is in fact a cross correlation because we do not uh, invert the, the sense when we apply the convolution filter. But this is okay. Well, let's say that this is a convolution. So we have our time series here X in, uh, in green and our filter of weight W. And so we can express the, the convolution operation as the linear combination between X and W. So you see that this is still a linear combination as for the um, the basic unit of MLP uh, network. The difference is here that the convolution filters as a given size, and we will slide over the full time series, our convolution filter. So let's say, okay, we will apply our convolution filter for each uh, time element in our time series. So let's say that we applied our convolution filter for time three, time four, time five. So we will have put a value at time four. So the computation that we will simply um, uh, perform here here is uh, 3 times minus 1 plus 0 times 2 plus uh, 1 times minus 1. That will give us the final value of minus 4. And here we have so several parameters. The main parameter is the filter size. So here I decided to take a size of, uh, of, of filter of 3, but this can be changed to uh, 5, 7, 9, or, or whatever. And there are also two other uh, parameters that might be important, the stride and the padding, but I will not uh, go into detail here. Uh, so why, okay, this convolution operation should work with time series data, uh, because, okay, it exists, we can define it formally, but why, okay, it's interesting to use it in CNN for, for time series. Because first time series, uh, CNN story has have various success in sequential data analysis like text, audio, and because also CNN are able to detect invariant patterns. So here we are in the similar problems and images where CNN have demonstrated their, their power, but we, are, we will apply it for time series. And this might be even an easier task than for images because we have one less dimension for time series and images. So here it's another example of applying um, the gradient convolution filter to our blue time series, and we will obtain the red time series. 
Uh, so in CNN, what we are doing currently, it's to learn the weight of the convolution filter during the network training. So instead of applying, you know, some given um, convolution filters like AGS filter, here we learn the weights of the filters that are most suitable for our uh, given classification problem. So, Okay, in CNN, we currently stack several convolution layers. Usually we use uh, pooling layers or we might use pooling layers. And then we end up with some dense layers to mix uh, the, the, the features that have been learned by the convolution layers, by the first convolution layers and how it put finally the class distribution and make, um, make a prediction. So, okay, let's go into one uh, architecture that has been used a lot in, in, in remote sensing, at least as a baseline architecture. So this is a temporal convolutional neural network that I developed with my colleagues in Monash. So here it's a very simple and basic um, architecture. That's why it's often used as a deep learning baseline. So we have as an input our uh, multivariate, for example, time series, and we will apply convolution filters and we will just mix the information with a dense layer here and another dense layer to output the class probability. Um, so here for each convolution we have a fixed filter size and we have no pulling layers between convolutions uh, because it's it works best for um, for satellite image time series classification. So, okay, this is the architecture. Maybe just a word about one important concept on this architecture, on this CNN architecture, which is the, the receptive field concept. So, um, unlike when we use uh, dense layers, the output in a CNN layer will depend uh, only on a region of the input signal. And this region is called the receptive field. So let's say that here in gray, we have our input time series. We have our sliding filter here in red. So the output is um, blue time series for the first layers. And for example, the element here in this time series depends only on the elements that are um, shaded here in blue. But when we add it a second layers, we increase our receptive field. This is normal because now the output here for the time element uh, in green, in the green time series, so will depend on the same size of receptive field for the blue time series, but for the gray time series here, the receptive field is much higher. So it means that for making the prediction here for the green time series, we use um, a, a bigger part of our input time series. And this receptive field concept is really important because if you try to detect some long uh, pattern in your time series, you should increase your receptive field. So you should increase uh, probably the size of your convolution filters. Uh, on contrary, if you try to detect just, uh, you know, some um, peak pattern on your, on your, on your time series, probably you can decrease your receptive field, so decrease the, the length of your convolution filters. So this is something quite important in CNN. Okay, so now let's move to uh, recurrent neural networks, so RNN. So RNN are intrinsically designed for sequence data. They are able to explicitly consider the temporal correlation of the data, and they are currently the state-of-the-art architecture for many time series um, problems like forecasting tasks. So how it works, so we have a recurrent cell. And so here we will do the computation at each time step t. So um, the state of the recurrent cell is affected by the past information that I called here that I denote by ht minus one and the current time series element that I denoted by xt. And we have also, uh, as previously, a set of trainable parameters, wx, wh, and bh, that are the trainable weights and the bias that we will be learned by back propagation through, through time. So, okay, if I formally write on this, we have the current state, so the hidden state, ht, that it is equal to the upper poly tangent of wx xt plus wh ht minus one plus bh. So let's say that their public tangent is our activation function, which is the case. Then we have this uh, computation that it is still similar, in fact, we was, which what we 
seen for the for the dense layers or for the convolutional neural networks, except that here we applied it at each time steps and we are using the previous information that has been learned. But we are all still doing some linear combination of our inputs with some, some weights. So usually we say that RNN are good at considering past, possibly future information during computations. Also, they are good at considering time series of different lengths, which is not the case for CNN architectures, but they are also slow to train due to the back propagation through time, and they fail to extract uh, long temporal dependencies. Another issue with, um, with RNN is the vanishing gradient issue. Uh, so this problem is that the influence of a given uh, input on the hidden layer and therefore on the network will either decay or sometimes blow exponentially uh, when we cycle around the different networks recurrent connection. And this is what we call the vanishing gradient issue. So here, okay, I take this illustration from Grave um, where we try to okay show what is the influence of the first time step element on the different outputs of our recurrent neural networks and so what we see okay the first um, element so when it's okay when the the here the shadow is darker it means that it has more uh, influence and what we see here is that the influence of the first input element will quite be uh, null at the at the for, for the final output because we are losing the the tract of this first element when we are applying rnn and there has been a solution that has been proposed that it's called the gated rnn so the both most known examples are the long short term memory and the gated recurrent unit so lstm and gru where here we introduce some gates to control the flow of of the information. So here we see the, the, the gates um, on the left, below and above the, the hidden layers, so the hidden state. And so we see that, okay, when there is a run, we will allow the information to flow on the network. And so here we see, okay, that for example, the first time step element shows the gate mechanisms can be used to make a prediction at the fourth or at the sixth element, which was impossible with standard RNN. So with gated RNN, usually we can learn um, long uh, long-term long dependencies. Uh, so in remote sensing, these architectures have been used also a lot. Here we have traditional architecture where we stack several RNN-like layers. So for example, here LSTM. So you, so you, as you see, there are many uh, references and there are probably some that I haven't even mentioned here. There is also a use of RNN for combining with, for example, CNN or other types of architecture, um, the, so the RNN architectures to try to exploit the temporal, but also the spatial structure on satellite image time series. So here we are not working only with time series information, but we we are working with also the images. So this is a, a bit out of the scope of my presentation, but I wanted still to say um, a word about it because this is a um, current trend in, in the field and it has been a lot used uh, as well. Okay, <clears throat> so let's move now to the first, uh, the, sorry, the last architecture that I want to introduce that are based on attention mechanisms. So attention mechanism, it's actually not very new. It has been initially proposed in 2014 by Badano and was linked with RNN architecture. But they have started to become very popular with uh, transformers in 2017 that have revolutionized a bit the use of RNN uh, and variants of RNN architectures because, okay, one drawback of RNN is that they are not fully using the GPU power uh, as there is this backpropagation through time that it is quite slow. In transformer, there, this issue does not exist and uh, we do the computation for all the time element in our time theory in once. So initially, the transformers has been proposed for uh, sentence translation, so it's quite complicated architecture composed of an encoder and decoder part. But in fact, for time series classification, which is obviously different than, um, uh, than sentence translation, the only part of the architecture that uh, interests us is on the left here on the, on, the, on, 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 on the figure. So let's just move to um, try to explain what is the attention mechanism. So given a values V, that is our sequence of observation, what we want to calculate is a result H that will be based only on classification relevant observation. So 
okay, if I try to maybe take an example, let's say that you have your time series and you want to denoise your time series. Uh, usually what you will do, it's for each time element in your time series, you will, for example, apply a Gaussian and say, okay, my new denoise time series, uh, it's equal for each time step at the current time step, but also a bit of the past and the future time step. So this is exactly what we do with attention mechanism. We try to rebuild a new time series where we, okay, put some attention on some specific part of the time series that are relevant for a given problem. So here, okay, we have our sequence observation. And for example, we output, okay, an attention score, uh, and we output an, a new element in the time series based on attention score. So with the matrix representation, we have the values here, we have the attention score. So that should uh, sum to one because it's, uh, it's probability. And so we will do the computation to obtain, for example, the new value here, 0 0.27. And if we apply this um, computation for all elements in our time series, we obtain a new time series uh, here, H. So here we have now, okay, let's say that we have a multivariate time series. We have, so we have um, um, our attention score that becomes a matrix, a square matrix, and we have our output that it is of the same size of our inputs. So um, the question is how, we can compute this attention score. So the hey here, how we can compute this matrix. Um, so a solution that has been proposed is to use so a query Q and keys to do this computation. So it might look a bit complicated, but okay, let's first talk about this uh, exponential divided by the sum of exponentials that it is here. This is what we call usually the softmax normalization. And here it's just to ensure that our um, attention score, so alpha t, will be will sum to, to 1 because we want some kind of similar probability stuff. Uh, so what it is in fact interesting in this uh, formulation of equation 1 is this k of q k t. And key here is what we call the alignment kernel function. It can be different stuff, but usually uh, it's a dot product or cosine uh, sin, sinus uh, similarity uh, function. And so we compare query with, with our key QT. And so the idea behind this alignment functions K is that large value, so the attention, uh, it will output sorry, a large value, so large attention, if the key is similar to query. Otherwise, it will output a small value if the key and the query are different. So let's take a concrete example with word embeddings. So here, we have so different word structure. So we have two words, structure and cows. We embed this word with the glove vector representation. So we obtain for structure and cow a vector representation of dimension 300. And we will compare with other vector representation of the, of the words in the sentence, live is what happened when you are busy making other plans. And by comparing so the feature, so the vector representation of structure and cows with each word in the sentence by, for example, using simply the dot product, so here QTK, we obtain this um, attention plot. So we see, for example, that structure is really similar with plants, okay, because the attention score here is above 0 0.5. And we see also that cow is really similar with life and uh, a bit less similar to happen. So that makes a bit of sense. So this works if your um, representation, so here I'll put it back glove vectors that have been used a lot, uh, a lot in, in uh, NLP uh, is a good uh, representation of, of your word, but obviously it gives us something. And the core idea here is that the two words, if they point in the same direction in the embedding space, this is which, uh, which, are, which is our 300 dimensional semantic glove vector, vector space, we will have a high attention here. Okay, so the, this is the data pro, uh, project attention where we use the softmax time, or the softmax story of the query times the key, and we multiply this by the value. So the softmax of the query times the key give us the attention score. So the question is how we can um, we can uh, we can sorry learn the query and the key. It has been proposed in the self-attention uh, mechanisms to just simply use the input of 
our input time series, so X, and just to learn some weights, so W key, W Q, and W V to output the query, the the sorry, the key, the query, and the value. I think I'm running uh, a bit out of time, so I will just jump to the to the conclusion. Uh, of, of the presentation to try to keep it on time. So, okay, here I described three main architectures for time series classification, CNN, RNN, and transformers inspired uh, architecture, which are currently uh, probably the, the state of the art, but there are also other strategies. So for example, based on neural ordinary differential equation, um, the performance, so here I didn't talk a lot about performance and how these different approaches compare for the sake of, uh, for the reason of, of time. Uh, but okay, the performance will depend on many factors. So first, the number of training data that you have, the number of classes that you have in your problem, the length of the time series, the temporal sampling, is it regular, irregular, and how, I mean, uh, what is the quality of, of, your, of your data in general. Um, so if you have like, you know, new idea or if you want to try out some time series classification uh, classification algorithm, you can benchmark it on data sets. So for example, breast crops that I have briefly mentioned at the beginning of the presentation or a bigger one like time uh, sent to crops that has been outputted this, this year. And so currently the research gaps and trends uh, in this uh, field, so for satellite image time series classification, there are several directions. The first one is about the data. So for example, how to make the most of spatial temporal structure of sequence of satellite images. So I mentioned, or I briefly um, show uh, some solution, for example, with Convel STM. One issue here is that usually it takes a lot of time um, for, the, for, for, for the training of networks that depends at on, on that depends on the on the spatial and the temporal structure of the data. There is also a question about how we can combine different modalities of data, for example, the radar and optical time series data with Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. And there are questions about architecture design, about the learning conditions that are very important because deep learning uh, algorithms require a lot of high quality um, training data, label data, and so there are questions about if we can learn with less supervision or if we can use what we have learned for other tasks in remote sensing. And there is also question about, okay, uh, the other things um, than accuracy, for example, the scalability or the explainability of the decision that we can take. Okay, that's all for, for me. I can go back on, on the transformers if I have uh, time and if there are questions on, on this. Thank you for, for your attention. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Charlotte. So we're having a little bit of a logistical issue. So we're going to have to change uh, the Zoom um, room. Uh, so I send uh, uh, to everybody a new, uh, new link. There is a new link in the chat and there is a new link in the, in the email. So if you don't mind, we will uh, go, we will continue the question on the new Zoom because this one is uh, limited to 100 people, even though we paid for 200, but that's, that's how it is. So the, the, the link is in the, in the chat or in the e email. Again, sorry for the inconvenience and see you in one minute. So do you want us to change now, uh, Louis? If, if you don't mind, yes. Okay, no worries. Thank you, Charles. Okay, so um, are we going to go through 100 or no? Yes, 101. Okay, so exactly this is working. So uh, thank you so much for the very interesting talk. Uh, I put a question just before. Um, I, I can't tell if there was a question or not in the chat. So if someone uh, asked a question, I, they wouldn't mind. Uh... I, I remember one question. Oh, okay. So okay. I think someone asked, but uh, hopefully the person is here, about, okay, if I can recommend different, um, you know, self, um, not self-attention, but um, yeah, attention-based architectures that have been used in remote sensing. So 
sorry for this because I, I was running a bit of time, so I skip a bit uh, some parts. So I guess one of the first work on using uh, transformers uh, idea was the work uh, by Mark uh, with self-attention for optical satellite image time series. So here I just display some results where we yeah. see the head. Um, Maybe can we cut the, um, yeah. the mic of the people <laughs> that do not speak? <laughs> Everybody cut the mic, please. Would be great. Okay, thank you. So here, okay, I display the, the, the some results of, of Mac paper where we see uh, on the top the input time series and on the on the bottom the output time series that uh, is computed by using here the attention score. So the the clearer is the ages, the more important is the, is the element in the input time series. And here we have different uh, we have different um, ed in the network. So Okay, Mark work is, is the first one. Another work uh, that uh, is currently kind of state of the art in, in satellite image time series classification is the work performed by, by Vivian that we also present today, I think, and, and Loic. So it's a temporal attention encoder of the pixel set encoder and temporal attention encoder, but the, the self-attention mechanism is in the TAE part. So here it's um, a, 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 a variant of the transformers where there have been some modification to adapt to satellite image time series uh, sp um, specificities, but it looks like uh, a transformer with a uh, with okay, some 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 small differences, and I'm sure that Vivian can answer all the question about this architecture better than than I can. There are also some other work. Um, I think there is a work of of uh, Yuan Yuan on self-supervised pretending tr of transformers for satellite image time series classification. I'm happy to to share more references um, if if needed. Thank you very much. Um, there is another question about how to extract a richer information uh, when the uh, time series are created by clouds. Do you have a um, so that's okay. That's an excellent question about you know how the cloud will affect the resource. So there are uh, two different trends, yeah. and I have work in uh, in I would say in both <laughs> in both sides. So I have not a clear answer for this. So I would say that, for example, during my PhD work, I worked a lot with um, clean data sets, uh, so clean as clean as we can, but at least where we take into account the cloud um, the cloud in the satellite image time series classification by doing some, uh, by applying some gap filling techniques. Uh, but also the current trend with um, attentions is in fact to say, okay, uh, now we can focus only on important element of satellite image time series classification and the algorithm will be able to 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 um, to care by itself uh, about the cloud data and here so this is so the this example, is of, example Mark of Mark paper paper can Sami <laughs> mute it himself thank you um, so here it's the the results of Mark paper where we see that when so this is the satellite image time series uh, for the different spectral bands so it was from on Sentinel to data and so here when you see that there are high values it corresponds usually to cloud um, to cloud in the images. And so you see for each head that in fact, they seem to focus on, um, on specific elements that are not cloudy and to not use the cloudy elements. And this is uh, the same for different head in the network where this, the cloud does not seem used for the prediction. And so Mark has worked on this. Uh, my feeling is that, okay, we need more extensive studies at large scale about how clouds affect um, really the performance of attention um, mechanisms um, uh, performance. So when I say large scale, it's like not only on one Sentinel-2 tiles, but more on, okay, uh, maybe 20, 30 uh, Sentinel-2 tiles, so really a, 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 a bigger, a bigger area. Um, the other thing that we can ask here is, okay, do should we use, I mean, which type of level of 
data should we use for our experiments? For example, with Sentinel-2, should we use um, top of atmosphere or top of canopy um, corrected images? And this also is not really clear because we still lack of an extensive study demonstrated, okay, if which which type of data is the, is the, is the most useful. But um, I would say that one advantage of using all the data at level 1C without caring about clouds is that the, is the fact that you will obtain some uh, regular time series that might help for the training of some algorithm. But still, if they are very noisy, uh, that can hurt their, their, their performance. So, okay, sorry for this long answer that it is even not um, very um, clear in the sense that, uh, okay, um, I think yeah, it depends on the application at the end as well, and and okay, more more work to be done here. This is often uh, often the, the case. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, I think we're going to move to the next speaker, uh, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure Charlotte will be happy to answer to answer your your questions. Uh. Uh, yes. Email. I hope you don't mind if I say that. <laughs> no, 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 no worries. Thank you, Rick, again for the invitation and uh, no good talk for all the next presenter. Um, up, stop sharing. So, Jan, can you share your screen? All right. Awesome. Uh, right, so let me quickly introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, which is uh, Jan uh, Jack Wegner, um, who did his PhD at uh, Leibniz University in Hanover and is now head of data science, uh, chair at uh, University of Zurich and head of the EcoVision Lab at uh, ETH Zurich and uh, has also been recognized as one of the top 25 uh, young scientists utilizing science for good by the World Economic Forum, which uh, is uh, very impressive. So thank you, Jan, for being here. And um, you can start whenever you want. Right, thanks a lot, Loic, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here and, and talk to everyone. And in the coming 20 to 25 minutes, I will present our work on um, towards high carbon stock maps at global scale, which is a joint work with Konrad Schindler, Nico Lang, and uh, Ralph Dubai and John Armston, partially also from the NASA JEDI team. All right, so the high carbon stock approach, what is that? So the, this so-called HCSA categorizes landscapes according to their carbon stock, which is important in terms of uh, mitigating climate change, for example, protecting the environment and um, areas of high biodiversity that often occur also in high carbon stock areas. And this HCSA defines what landscape to protect and which landscapes can be developed. And this is essential for a lot of multinational companies like um, Barry Kalebaut, Donest, Le Cargill, Unilever, who follow this HCSA approach in their no deforestation policies in their supply chains. For example, if they are sourcing um, palm oil in uh, Southeast Asia or cocoa in West Africa, for, for example, and they ask their suppliers to adhere to it. And you see in this image that I basically <laughs> copy pasted and stole from the HCSA people, from the technical leaflet, how this is, is done. And the, the idea is very simple. So you basically, you try to come up with a map uh, that tells, okay, that looks at, that protects everything uh, left from this orange vertical dotted line. So everything left. So the young regenerating forest, low density, medium density, high density forest, this is all above a certain carbon threshold per hectare. And this should be protected. Um, and to to have um, um, to protect this um, piece of land, and then everything below this threshold can possibly be developed. And of course, this is overly simple. Then there are further um, considerations that are done. For example, um, land use rights of indigenous people or other high carbon areas that do not necessarily have forest on them. Let's say peatland and so on, or mangroves, for example, also. And the problem here is the implementation. So today this is done by usually aerial LIDAR campaigns. So there's 
and if a, a palm oil a plantation owner wants to expand this um, oil palm plantation in Indonesia somewhere, they have to bring in a consulting company that then hire a contractor that fly the whole area, for example, with airborne LiDAR, or they buy satellite images and try to map manually areas that should be protected. And to calibrate these uh, maps, always people have to go into the forest and re really uh, assess biomass my, and biomass and carbon stock in, in, in point-wise distributed across the area. And you can easily imagine that leads to a lot of different methods. And also since the plantation owner pays the, the mapping, um, there is um, also a lot of different methods that are applied in a certain tendency um, for the contractor to um, deliver products that please the plantation owner. So what we saw in a lot of these maps that are often also confidential is that biomass is underestimated because there's a strong pressure, economic pressure also to expand the oil palm plantations. And this is also ex expensive, of course, these campaigns. So they lack also transparency and objectiveness. They, they do not scale, you do them once and then that's it. You cannot scale them globally. You cannot fly the whole globe with an airplane um, every couple of months again. And then the quality is low. So what we are aiming at here is that um, we come up with an approach to produce these high carbon stock maps or, um, globally consistent. So one approach for everything, they should be open source. So the maps should be publicly available. The source code should be publicly available. The method itself, everything should be transparently evaluated using good scientific practice such that we get something that is acceptable and, and transparent. So in, in this talk, I will um, sort of quickly give an overview of how we do that. And we do it in basically um, three steps. So the first one is that um, we do a dense canopy height regression per pixel from Sentinel-2 images. And then the second is that we need to scale our reference data to global scale in order to be trained, uh, in order to be able to train our models. And this is why we calibrate then this JEDI LiDAR um, canopy um, height predictions. And the third one is that we combine the two, point 0.1 and point 0.2, so dense canopy height regression trained on globally distributed LiDAR reference points, and we come up with uh, dense canopy height and, and indicative HCS maps. So let's look at the first um, part. So here the idea is that we think of canopy height prediction as sort of a monocular depth problem. So you probably know that any multi-view or even um, dual views and any stereo and with center two is difficult. And if you think of tropical regions that you would need multiple views cloud-free on the same place, it's difficult. What we want to do here is that we regress from single views only on the vegetation or the canopy height. And so the input is the Sentinel-2 image. And um, then uh, yeah, we, we use um, basically 18 um, separate convolutional blocks and the output is then a canopy height layer and a 10 by 10 meter raster. And what we also do is that we avoid, in comparison to standard computer vision architectures, we avoid uh, down or up sampling. So we said strike to one. We don't do max pooling here to not use, lose spatial resolution. And then we have this, um, yeah, we use the separate convolution, separable convolution blocks, um, 18 of them, such that we not only learn spectral features that correlate with the canopy, but also spatial context, which turned out to be important here for our case, and, and texture features. And then um, we apply a standard loss function for regression, so L2 loss. And um, we have two case, test cases where we have um, airborne reference data where we can train, validate, and test our approach on. So unsurprisingly, one is Switzerland, where we know all our colleagues. And we have two test regions here from our colleagues of WSL. And the other one comes from the NASA Elvis campaign, is in the country of Gabon. And Gabon is in West Africa and was chosen because it have, has a lot of dense um, natural rainforest and a lot of very high trees. And if we do that, so now this is the canopy height prediction. 
um, for Switzerland and um, color encodes the canopy heights, everything dark is low, close um, to, to zero, what is black, everything oranges and then yellow is very high. And here in Switzerland, uh, we have trees up to 40 meters high, although those are very rare. And um, so if we zoom in, so here's the, in this uh, white box here in, in, in Kaubünden, we zoom in, um, we see that we can nicely um, detect a lot of fine-grained canopy height structure, and we come up with an overall mean absolute error of around 1.7 meters. Yeah. And of course, this is not as good as if you would do an, an aerial LIDAR campaign or um, something like this, um, but one should see it as sort of an additional complementary um, thing that you can do, because now this is sort of a, let's say, uh, cheap way to do um, annual updates, something that you cannot do with aerial LIDAR campaigns, even not in Switzerland, uh, too expensive. In for Gabon, so this is the country of, of Gabon, the outline again, the same color encoding, now up uh, to um, 60 meter high trees and even, even higher, so they're even higher trees. Again, the, the white box uh, here in this delta um, shows an interesting part. So you can see here and the zoom in and the very high trees, so which is yellow, orange is, is the mangroves in the delta. And those are also nicely detected in the, and they are very high trees also. So this is, was also detected mostly with a good accuracy. And of course, the I mean absolute error is worse. We have much higher trees. And I will also show you in a minute that our approach, of course, also saturates at some, some um, certain height. And okay, so once we have this, um, we basically have to um, scale our reference data to global scale, right? Because now we used airborne LIDAR and data and, and very high resolution, good quality data. And if we want to scale globally, we have to move to different reference data. And this is when we got in touch with the NASA JEDI team. So John Armstrong arrived to Bayer. And um, so, and here now the goal is uh, with the JEDI LIDAR product to get uh, globally, but scars and footprints that and each point wise footprint gives one, provides one reference um, data point for the canopy height. And so this is um, the International Space Station, the ISS, and this is where this uh, JEDI laser scanner is mounted. You see it here in the video. It's looking down on Earth with eight beams, um, four with high intensity and four with more coverage. And you also see that there's a gap between um, the, the, the scan lines and then also a long track. There are gaps between the points several hundred meters up to some kilometer. And this is the full waveform a signal that usually comes back from the forest. So you, and you see up more than a thousand returns sometimes. So when you, get, you see that you get a nice vertical profile here of the forest. So usually you get a big peak in the top of the canopy with a lot of refractance here, then a bit less in the branches, and then again, some sort of a ground peak. And what we do now in the following is that we basically regress the distance between the top peak and the bottom peak. And we also implicitly detect them in the same goal. So we use a deep learning um, approach again to for each of these um, raw full waveform LIDAR signals regress the canopy height and then use it as reference data to train our model for dense canopy height prediction using Sentinel-2. So those are the reference sites now that we got from, um, from Ralph and John. And um, you see that um, a lot of them, of course, in, in, in North America and the US, because this is where they are based and have a lot of context. But there are also some in Europe, uh, some in Africa, in, in Australia, Indonesia, and so on. Unfortunately, none in China, but uh, hopefully this will also come at some point. And so what they do is that um, their internal processing is that they use this um, reference site. They have full wave from Airborne LiDAR, and they use that reference data to simulate JEDI full waveform data. And then they co-register this, the real 
um, waveforms from the Jedi sensor that, circuit that, that orbits the Earth um, to the simulated ones. And this is how they encourage this uh, and geolocate to the ground truth. Yeah. This is important if you later on think about evaluation and accuracy. So and this is then um, what um, Nico did to calibrate the JEDI data. So on the left side, you see the raw input waveform. And uh, to the right side, you see the amplitude always. And also some, we point here at the canopy top and crown, you see that some peaks are also not as clear and clean as you would hope. And a lot of them then are like this. And then to basically assign um, better calibrated uncertainty estimate, to each output of the models. Um, we use basically a, a, an ensemble of models that always outputs distributions, so a mean and a variance for each canopy height predictions. And um, so each CNN model, so all have the same architecture, is trained separately starting from random initializations. And we have these two outputs per model to approximate then the conditional distribution and the loss function is this uh, Gauche negative log likelihood. And then we optimize CNN parameters within a standard way with the stochastic gradient descent. And we, always, we usually see that already, um, if we take an ensemble of five models, it converges to a good solution. And, and if you have 10 models, it's usually completely sufficient. So more than 10, from our experience, we, we didn't need. So and then you have this different model outputs. So you get uh, basically uh, Gaussian estimates for, for all the model outputs for the canopy height. So now here an example for three different models and you see it plotted here, the three Gaussians with the different mean and variance. And what you then do to combine all of those into one consistent um, uncert calibrated uncertainty is that you basically again approximate the Gaussian um, that goes that sort of um, um, collects all the information of this mixture of cautions in this one. And then we follow the standard approach um, that was also proposed by others before. It's not, not uh, from us, like Kendall Gall, for example, in, in Vision, um, to um, basically combine epistemic and aleatoric um, parts and output one variance for each um, pixel on the ground. So if you have that, so how do you then validate the, this output for this regression problem? So what, um, is, what we do is that we have, of course, for the ground truth, for the uh, ground truth parts where we have it, we, have an, we can uh, um, predict the root mean square error, which is plotted here on, on the y-axis. So this is the root mean square error from our model predictions compared to the ground truth. And we can then compare it to the predicted standard deviation of our model for each um, pixel, basically. And here, um, what you see here, this histogram-like structure is that um, we sort of um, group the sets here of those predictive standard deviations between two meters, four meters, six meters, and so on. So you basically, each point here um, means that we compare it to a set of predicted standard deviations here. And you see that, the, so if everything is perfect, then this blue dotted line should uh, exactly follow the diagonal here. And you see that, of course, we are, it's not perfect, but we are getting close. And you also see, uh, interesting, that where we have a lot less value for the high standard deviations, um, we get a bit more uh, error here. So, and if you have that, so one advantage is now that you, you, you have um, a better calibrated uncertainty for each footprint, um, we can then filter out all the predictions and only uh, set the recall, let's say, to 70% of the most certain values. So we basically get rid of the 30% with the highest uncertainty. Um, because if you recall and re remember, we want to use them as reference data. So we want to get rid of a lot of error and rather say, okay, if there's a lot of error, then I wait for the JEDI sensor to, to fly around the globe a bit more and wait until it comes back to the same point again and or to the similar or close point and then do the same procedure again and hope for better calibrated and, and more accurate values. And this is then a map um, of the canopy height that we estimate. And here we crop it to 35 meters just for color scale. But 
and of course it goes higher above um, 60 meters. And the global RMSE then here is if we do this recall of 70%, so we, we throw away the 30% most uncertain values, we get a global root mean square of 2.7 meters. And if we look a bit closer for this result with a 70% recall, we also see that we have a tendency to underestimate high trees. So here on the, on the left, on the y-axis, again, we plot the residuals and on the bottom, um, we point the, the, the um, predicted canopy, so the canopy heights on the, from the ground truth in this case. So this is the RH 1998, so it's basically top height of the canopy. And we see the higher the trees get, so to 16, 70 meters here, uh, the more we underestimate. And that's a general problem, of course, if you look at the tree height distribution on the right here on the histogram, you also see that in that range, we have almost no values. Uh, so it's very hard to train the uh, machine learning, let alone a deep learning model here. And that's an open question in, in general, how to deal with this uh, long tail distribution, not only for our case. Uh, um, but in our case, it is important. We should um, make an effort to get rid of that because the biomass in the carbon stock um, does not grow linearly with uh, tree height, but more so. So the high trees contribute over proportionally more biomass. And this is what is important for us. So it is, um, if you start your PhD, look into how to deal with this problem. This is important. If you have an idea, let us know. So, and then we move to the last part of um, this. So now we have, I've shown you in the first part how we can regress canopy height from individual central two images. In the second part, now I've shown you how we can basically get the reference data set at global scale, well calibrated with, with uncertainty outputs. Now in the third part, I will show you how um, Nico puts all of this together to finally get this HCS maps. So now we combine the two, as I told you. So the JEDI um, points we use as reference data and we train then a model that regresses canopy height and then in the next stage, we train another model that translates canopy high to carbon stock to finally arrive at this indicative high carbon stock map that we wanted from the start. So this is now a, a map, a canopy height, a 10 meter ground sampling distance of Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. When we combine the calibrated sparse JEDI footprints that we use as reference data to train a model for dense Sentinel-2 imagery um, prediction of canopy height. And again, the canopy height is color coded, so everything dark is, glow, is, is lower, everything brighter, more yellowish is much higher trees. So you see here in the center of Borneo, uh, for example, very high trees. So, and now what we do now is that we have the canopy height. Uh, we look for carbon density uh, uh, reference points to train another ensemble of methods, uh, another ensemble of CNNs to basically um, predict um, carbon density from canopy height. And, and fortunately, we have a good reference data here in the north of Borneo from the ESNA lab, who did map a bigger region um, with a large campaign with ground truth measurements and aerial data and so on in the Sabah region. And this is what we use then as our uh, calibration field. And if you do that, so we um, translate the canopy heights to carbon stocks and then we threshold um, at different carbon stock levels using the HCSA definition. And then we also add more map layers that are interesting for applications. So we have separate projects that mapped all the palm oil and palm oil density even. So everything here with the egg white color is palm oil plantation. We also mapped the coconut in the Philippines with the light blue. And we took the Copernicus built up urban layer here, the red, red ones. And um, all of this is also open source and online. You can play with it. And if the slides are later on shared with all the participants, you can click on the link and play with the map. So, and all of this now gets us uh, to an accuracy of around 86%. If we look only at the threshold between the high carbon stocks, so this is this, the high carbon stock, everything here below the line should be protected. Everything above can be turned in, into some plantation or urban developments and so on. Of course, you always have to be a bit careful here because it's still missing additional layers. 
like indigenous land rights and also peatland, we didn't consider it here future work and so on. So just a summary how that goes. So this is a comparison of one of the regions. So this is the central two image. Uh, looks very beautiful, I always think. And then we predict the canopy height from this. And this is a palm oil plantation in the aircraft. And you see it here in the central two image already nicely, the uh, plantation. And then we go from the canopy height with the ensemble of CNNs again to the indicative HCS classification. Yeah, this is how the whole pipeline goes. All right, so almost done. So what are the next steps? So, and now maybe those who are also working in this domain know that there's a new JEDI biomass product. So there's not all only a canopy height, but also a biomass product. And this is of course, so um, can be a bit a shortcut for our method because, and it's also helpful because we no longer have to look for local calibration uh, like in the north of Borneo from the ESNA lab, but now we also have basically a global distribution of, of biomass values and we could directly go and predict biomass from central two images or still go by a canopy height prediction and then take a, let's say, more hierarchical approach. Then we should scale globally. So at the moment we have Southeast Asia. Now we, we want to do it also for cocoa regions in, in West Africa, for example. We need more land cover layers. And so for cocoa, we have already but peatland and mangroves. And then if we think about Latin America, also rubber, um, so rubber also for Africa and Southeast Asia, but soy and pastures for Latin America. Then we are also currently building a rapid forest degradation alert system using Sentinel-1 data. So every six days, it should spit out an alert or not if someone is starting to chop down the rainforest. And um, then we ultimately want to make this a publicly available open tool to everyone. And um, so last slide. So some exciting future directions. So of course, since we are working on it, I always think uncertainty estimation and deep learning is cool and great and important. I think there's a lot to be explored still. Um, also, um, if you think about what uh, Charlotte presented before for time series, for analysis, for RNNs and so on. I think the, for crop classification also, I think it, it's an exciting topic to think about how to better calibrate uncertainties without having to run deep ensembles all the time, which waste a lot of resources. Then um, combining machine learning and physics-based modeling, so physics constrained or consistent learning is interesting. Everything also that is under this buzzy term of explainable AI, so really understanding um, what kind of evidence is, is the deep net looking at and so on. And then last but not least, um, I'm running around uh, and talking about work that basically other people do. And the guy who did all of this here that I presented today is Nico Lang. And uh, he will finish his PhD in spring next year and will be on the job market and looking for a postdoc. So if you're excited about what he is doing, um, let him know and reach out to him. With this, I thank you for uh, your attendance and for listening and uh, open for questions. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jan. We have just a, a few short, short, short minutes. So I read some of the questions from the chat. Uh, one question asking you about the pre-training, asking you if you use a pre-trained model trained in Gabon and Switzerland when using uh, your sparse Jedi ventures. Um, no, we don't do that. So we didn't do that. Um, you could possibly do that. We didn't need it also for Jedi. We had a lot of training data. So we started off with training and pre-training on simulated data and then retraining, fine-tuning on the real data. This turned out not to work so well. And we basically ended up on training on real data only because the simulated data, uh, we got a lot of overfitting uh, quickly with our model because it was just too, too simple. And we found that noise was just a perfect regularizer that we needed. So we didn't do pre-training, we trained from scratch from on real waveforms directly. Thank you. Uh, Charlotte asks if there is a, what are the link on the C energy with a biomass mission from ESA? Are you? Sorry, say it again. I so uh, how can the biomass mission help for your application? So the biomass product, of course, is now basically the same that we calibrated the footprints for canopy height. And now um, it's not only available for canopy height, but also for biomass. So for each and every plant, you get the biomass. 
So now we can use that directly as reference data. We don't have to do the detour in theory via canopy height map. And then um, you can go and predict biomass directly if you would want to. But um, you could also do another way and uh, keep our approach and have the canopy height map and then sort of calibrate that directly using the biomass value. But of course, one question is always um, how accurate is the, the product a bit, right? Because this is why we did in the first place the whole deep learning approach um, to calibrate again the, the raw waveforms from the Jedi LiDAR to canopy heights because the original product that was released first was just well inaccurate and too, too not accurate enough for our application. So um, I think the biomass product is great. It can be very helpful for us and for many other applications, but I would want to see a bit of an accuracy analysis of that. I see. Thank you. Um, a question asking you, uh, why did you decide to use a cost resolution for the generation of your global canopy height? And if it would be better to use a global forest canopy height map produced by Maryland University at a 30 meter resolution? Oh, but we have a much higher resolution. We have 10 meter mm -hmm. resolution, not 30. So ours is already much higher. And then the forest cover um, map, I think this is also, so it can be helpful if you want to do a GIS analysis. And we also used parts of that. Um, it's one on one of the slides. We use the MODIS and a slightly different version to filter out all the non-forested areas for the canopy high prediction. So that we used, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just ask a question of, uh, of my own. So, uh, when you learn to go from uh, when you go from canopy height to carbon stock, uh, are you learning this? Or are you using a biophysical model? It's all learned. All learned. Learn all of that. Yes, and and we found so we are also compared it, and of course, I'm very open to any suggestions to also combine it with biophysical models. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. But maybe let me add one thing that is always a bit, let's say. Um, the criticism from the forestry people of uh, overfitting and, and so on. We found, and you can read the paper in detail, yeah, but you we found that our method generalizes very well. So if we train, let's say, in, in the US for the JEDI calibration, it, it also predicts and generalizes well for Indonesia and so on. Uh, so the general, it nice to generalize. And we also have only one single model globally for the JEDI calibration. So it's not that we have all different kinds of models and it's, it's mm -hmm. not the case. Because there is quite a, a huge uh, domain shift, right? A temporal, spatial, bioclimatic, and different sensors. Uh, do you think your model generalizes so well because it's an ensemble Bayesian method? Or? So I think that the, 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 the Jedi calibration for canopy height, in, in the end, what the thing does is it looks between the distance of the canopy top and the, the bottom footprint. And if you, you learn this across a certain variety of forests, I think then it doesn't change so much for the rest of the globe. So I think it, it doesn't look at much more than that. We don't know because we didn't do any explainable stuff or anything. So this is missing, of course, and, and interesting to explore in the future. But um, yeah, so, so, so um, yeah, good question. But um, um, I think that's, that's the case because the, the, the real problem is pretty easy to solve. But uh, important nonetheless. Uh, well, thank you very much. I think we go uh, to the next, uh, the next talk. Vivian, if you're here. Yes, hi. Hi. Can you share your screen? Yes. So, Vivian is a PhD student of mine. He's uh, defending his PhD in uh, January, and uh, he will join uh, Jan uh, um, postdoc uh, ne next year. So this is a recent work. So v v Vivian, yeah, thanks, Loïc. So hi everyone, thanks for attending. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, panoptic segmentation of agricultural parcels from satellite image time series. So this work is uh, basically the content of our uh, latest paper that got accepted at ICCB this year. And uh, we have three main contributions in the paper. First, we introduced a novel encoder for a satellite image time series, the UTAE. And this encoder sets a new state of the art for semantic segmentation. 
And then to tackle the task of panoptic segmentation, we introduce an instant segmentation module, parcel those points, which sets the first uh, state of the art for panoptic segmentation. And to allow evaluation of such methods, we introduce also PASTIS, uh, a new benchmark, panoptic satellite image time series, which is the uh, first benchmark with panoptic annotations of satellite image time series. So this is basically the content of the, of the 40 slides as well. So the driving, driving path of, the, of, the, of this work is crop type mapping. So crop type mapping is the production of a map that uh, identifies the boundaries and crop type of each agricultural parcel in a given territory. And this type of information has a lot of applications ranging from uh, subsidy allocation to environmental monitoring. And in several countries, such as France, um, the production of these maps relies on a manual declaration by uh, farmers. Uh, in France only, that's 10 million uh, parcels that are annotated each year. So from a machine learning perspective, that can be seen as a virtually unlimited uh, source of annotation. Uh, and on the other hand, we now have access to uh, high resolution uh, both temporally and spatially remote sensing data. Uh, in this work, we use Sentinel-2. So Sentinel-2 multispectral imagery, which is well suited for uh, vegetation monitoring. Uh, and yeah, because it's to this date, the best open access uh, source of data in terms of uh, spatial and temporal resolution. So with this uh, observational data and using the uh, annotations uh, of the farmers, the broad uh, aim of this work is to uh, develop methods to automatize at least partly, partly the production of crop type maps. Um, so this task of crop type mapping uh, is typically addressed as a classification problem in the literature, either at pixel level, uh, where a semantic label is uh, predicted for each pixel, or at object level, if, uh, if the boundaries of the parcel are assumed to be known, and so uh, the, parcel, the whole parcel is classified based on the sequence of observation. But in many locations, uh, this assumption that we know uh, we have access to the boundaries of the parcel is a bit too strong because parcel boundaries are uh, not known or can change over years. So, and on the other hand, it's an uh, information that is important for some applications. In, in the case of subsidy allocation, it's, it's important to be able to uh, instantiate, to, to distinguish uh, each individual parcel and uh, attribute it to uh, its owner. So that's, that, 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 that motivated us to frame uh, the crop type mapping problem more generally as, a, as a, um, an instant segmentation problem where we want to train models both to predict uh, the parcel boundaries and the crop type, such as uh, the, uh, such a model, I mean, we show an illustration of this uh, in the figure. And um, since um, agricultural parcels uh, do not overlap, uh, this motivated us to frame uh, more specifically the problem as a panoptic segmentation problem, which became a, a standard uh, task in the computer vision literature. Um, so to perform panoptic segmentation, we first need to uh, encode uh, our satellite image time series into uh, relevant feature maps. Uh, at a high level, we can describe satellite image time series as a sequence of images and can thus be uh, seen as similar data to video data, but there are some uh, key differences between these two types of data. So we, we argue that we cannot directly use the plethora of methods that have been de developed in the computer vision literature for uh, video encoding name a few uh, differences. Uh, so the frame, the special frame of reference of uh, satellite image time series is fixed and absolute, take, thanks to the georeferencing of, uh, of satellite images, whereas it's relative in video data. The acquisition time in satellite image time series contains crucial and crucial information. So the, um, the same observation will not convey the same meaning if it was taken at the beginning of the growing season or at the end, whereas the acquisition time of video frames is typically arbitrary. Uh, and also one, one other big difference, is, di difference between the two types of data is uh, that uh, due to cloud obstruction, uh, the sampling rate of satellite image time series tend, tends to be uh, uneven, whereas it's regular for uh, video data. So the point here is just to say that uh, due to these differences, we, we focus on developing dedicated methods, dedicated encoders for satellite image time series. 
so here we show a quick review of uh, recent uh, state-of-the-art approaches for satellite image time series encoding. <clears throat> and uh, we found that a good way to uh, categorize them is uh, based on uh, whether a spatial encoding and temporal encoding is performed uh, at different spatial scales. And uh, we found that what seems to be successful in, in recent uh, approaches is that uh, both spatial and temporal encoding operates at uh, different spatial scales in the feature pyramid uh, plus convalescium and the 3D units. But in those uh, architectures, temporal encoding relies either on uh, recurrent neural nets for this architecture or uh, temporal convolution in, in the 3D units. And we've seen in, in previous work on parcel-based classification that we obtain better results with uh, self-attention-based uh, temporal encoding. <clears throat> so in, in our work, we propose uh, a novel uh, spatial temporal encoder that will uh, encode uh, special that will perform spatial and temporal encoding at different spatial resolutions and uh, use temporal self attention for temporal encoding. <clears throat> so we base our arch architecture on the LTIE, which Charlotte already briefly introdu introduced. So the Lightweight temporal attention encoder is a simplified uh, self-attention encoder that we derive from the transformer. It's based on a self-attention mechanism similar to that of the transformer, but which we uh, modified a bit to be more uh, parameter and memory efficient. And we showed on parcel-based classification that it's uh, more uh, uh, that it's um, it, it provides better performance than uh, uh, an off-the-shelf transformer. Um, and so the, the, main, the, the, the broad idea of, of architecture is that we integrate this uh, LTIE in a unit uh, architecture. So the unit architecture is, com is composed as typically of an encoding and decoding branch. Uh, the encoding branch is applied in parallel to each uh, image of the input time series, producing sequences of feature maps. We have success, su successful, uh, successive um, strided convolutions to reduce the resolution uh, at the different levels. And at the lowest resolution level, we apply uh, our temporal encoder uh, pixel-wise and uh, col thus collapse the temporal dimension and obtain a single feature map uh, representing the whole uh, sequence of inputs. Uh, decoding then operates as it typically does in a, in a unit architecture. And so one, the second main idea of this architecture is that since we want to perform temporal encoding at different spatial scales, we reuse the attention masks that were computed here at the lowest resolution in the computation of the skip connections at the upper levels. To do that, we simply need to uh, resample the attention masks obtained here to the resolution at, of the upper levels. Uh, this, for instance, can allow the model to uh, avoid taking into account cloudy observation in the computation of the skip connections. As a comparison, uh, what is typically done in multi-temporal unit architecture is to simply compute uh, temporal means uh, for the skip connections. So this, this way of, of doing doesn't allow, uh, for instance, to avoid uh, cloudy observations. So <clears throat> to test our methods, uh, we developed the, and, and released the PASTIS benchmark. So uh, panoptic satellite image time series. Uh, it's composed of around 2,500 temporal patches of size uh, 128 pixels, Sentinel-2 pixels, so 10 meter pixels. And for each of these temporal patches, uh, we have between 33 and 61 acquisitions of Sentinel-2, corresponding to the agricultural year of uh, 2019. Uh, the patches are taken in four different um, regions of France, and uh, the agricultural parcels are grouped into 18 uh, semantic classes. And for each parcel, we also provide uh, the uh, instance mask, as shown here, to uh, also allow to evaluate uh, panoptic segmentation approaches. <clears throat> um, to standardize a bit the, 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 benchmark, the benchmark results, we also provide an official five-fold split with a one kilometer buffer between uh, different folds. So we first evaluated our uh, UTAE on PASTIS uh, simply for semantic segmentation and compared it to the other uh, approaches that we uh, saw in the literature review. 
And so uh, our results show that our UTAE uh, brings a significant performance imp improvement of around five points of uh, mean intersect over union and is also competitive uh, in terms of uh, inference time. Um, you can you can check the paper for a more detailed uh, ablation study, but one of the most uh, salient results is that uh, this performance improvement is mostly explained by um, the use of the attention masks in the skip connections. If we replace this uh, mechanism by simple uh, temporal means, the performance of our approach drops to uh, 58 points of uh, MIUU, which is uh, to, uh, at a similar level to the other approaches. So uh, it, it sort of seems to validate the fact that uh, having a temporal encoding at different special scales is uh, key to uh, good semantic segmentation performance. And we show an illustration of this helps on this figure where we show, so on the first column, the annotation uh, of pastis uh, of, of uh, the semantic class of, of each pixel, the prediction of our model, the UTAE, and uh, two predictions made by the unit plus uh, bidirectional convolutional con con convolutional LSTM model, which performs temporal encoding only at a coarse re resolution, and the convolutional GRU, which only performs temporal encoding at a, at a fine resolution. And so, uh, what, what often happens, for instance, in the convolutional GRU, is that since uh, temporal encoding only operates at, at a fine, at a fine uh, spatial scale, this model will struggle to make a consistent uh, predictions on a large uh, spatial zone. <clears throat> on the other hand, the uh, UB convalescent uh, will uh, don't won't have the same problem. But since uh, temporal encoding is performed at a coarse spatial scale, this model will struggle to uh, correctly predict uh, small parcels such as this one. And uh, in contrast, the UTAE uh, seems to uh, behave quite well in both cases. So making consistent uh, predictions on large uh, spatial scales and also correctly uh, retrieving uh, small fine uh, parcels such as these ones. So uh, with this UTAE encoder as backbone, we can then uh, shift to uh, our more complex task, complex task of panoptic segmentation where so as we said in the introduction, our goal now is to both predict a unique instance ID for each pixel and a vector of class course or a crop type. So to do, to do that, we follow the recommendations of the authors of uh, panoptic segmentation. So we start with an instance segmentation step and then apply a pseudo uh, non-maximum su suppression procedure to uh, produce panoptic predictions, which means uh, a non-overlapping set of uh, fit, uh, instance masks. <clears throat> so for instance segmentation, um, the state of the art in computer vision uh, currently relies on uh, region proposal approaches such as Masker CNN, which are notoriously uh, compute intensive due to their uh, two-stage uh, framework. And there's another uh, promising stream of uh, work in uh, single stage approaches such as solar or center mask. And uh, in our setup, since the encoding of the input satellite image time series is already quite compute intensive, we focused on these uh, single stage approaches and we decided to uh, heavily adapt uh, the center mask approach. <clears throat> so one specificity of the center mask, uh, I mean, the main, <laughs> the main specificity of the center mask approach is that instead of using uh, anchors, uh, it formulates the problem of detection as the uh, regression of centerness. So uh, how is this performed? We first construct a centerness ground truth from uh, the center and parcels of uh, the center and, and shapes of uh, each parcel. So this is uh, our uh, centerness ground truth, which uh, which we try to regress. Um, I mean, we train our model to regress this centerness ground truth based on the observed uh, satellite image time series. And then detected objects are simply defined as the local maxima uh, in the predicted predicted centerness heat map. Um, so we keep this uh, formalism of center mask and adapt uh, the rest of the pipeline to construct our uh, parcels as points uh, instance segmentation module. 
So this module takes as inputs uh, the, the feature maps computed by a UTAE at different spatial levels, uh, special, special resolutions. And it will first uh, regress from the high resolution feature map, the sentinel heat map, uh, to, uh, as we said in the previous slide, uh, detect objects. Uh, and the rest of the pipeline is used to predict for each detec detected object uh, a class uh, a vector class score, so the, 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 the crop types, and uh, produce uh, uh, an instance mask. So at a, at a high uh, at a high level, the computation of the instance masks relies on a high resolution silency uh, map and uh, local uh, shape prediction that are combined additively here and refined with the residual uh, CNN. So this, this module is trained end-to-end uh, -end with, uh, with the UTAE uh, and is supervised with a four-term loss. Uh, so the first ter term um, supervises the prediction, the regression of the Sentinel's heat map with a logistic re regression loss with a focal term. Uh, class prediction is uh, supervised with binary cross-entropy. Size prediction is supervised with a normalized L1 loss, and shape prediction is supervised with a binary cross-entropy between the predicted mask and the true instance mask. And for efficiency in our setup, we decided to uh, supervise at most one predicted point, a certain point per ground truth object uh, at train time. And so uh, in our experiments, we report the panoptic metrics, uh, again, as recommended by the authors of uh, panoptic segmentation. So the panoptic uh, metrics are the segmentation quality uh, and recognition quality. And the product of, of these two metrics is the panoptic quality metric. Each metric is computed first uh, per, per each class. And, uh, and the uh, aggregated metrics are the uh, unweighted uh, class-wise average uh, metrics. So we evaluate our uh, approach of UTAE and PAPS on our uh, BASTIS datasets and uh, obtain a, fir a first milestone for uh, uh, panoptic segmentation of satellite image time series at 40.4 points of uh, panoptic quality. Uh, we, we tried replacing um, we tried replacing our UTAE by a unit and convolutional STM as backbone and observed a, a quite a big drop of seven points of panoptic quality, which sort of confirmed that our uh, UTAE is uh, also a good backbone for panoptic segmentation. <coughs> um, so we show uh, on the image on the right some uh, qualitative results of our methods. So the first column is, the, is one image of the sequence of the Sentinel-2 observations. Uh, the second column is the are the panoptic annotations uh, in uh, in the PASTIS dataset. The third column is the prediction are the predictions made by by our uh, panoptic segmentation model, and the last column uh, are the predictions made by the semantic segmentation model. So the first thing um, the the first thing to say is that semantic predictions are uh, mostly correct if you if you compare the the color the color of the color maps between um, semantic prediction and, and annotations, most of the time the, the semantic prediction is correct. Uh, and it's also the case in, in the pan panoptic segmentation um, predictions. Uh, so this suggests that the, most of the struggle in uh, panoptic segmentation comes from uh, correctly detecting uh, the presence of a parcel and then correctly uh, predicting uh, the instance mask of each parcel. And so, uh, we saw, we, we see in this uh, in this figure uh, some examples of uh, how this can be difficult. Uh, on the bottom of the bottom row here, we can see that for a very thin and small parcels such as the vive ones here, uh, the panoptic segmentation model struggles a lot and actually doesn't detect any of them. And another failure case is uh, is. Uh, is a case such as the one in the in the green uh, circle, where we have a large uh, parcel uh, that is annotated as, as a single parcel, but has clear subdivisions uh, within it. Uh, but since it uh, belongs to a, a, a single farmer and uh, is probably managed as, as a single uh, agricultural parcel, is annotated as a single object, 
and this this type of cases will uh, will be uh, difficult for the panoptic segmentation, which will um, struggle to make a, 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 a consistent prediction with the annotations. But we also see some uh, uh, positive effects of framing the problem of uh, of crop type mapping as a panoptic segmentation problem here in the in the blue circle, where where we see a parcel where the semantic segmentation uh, model. Uh, was making consistent prediction uh, across the parcel, but uh, sort of forcing the model to make a, a single prediction for the whole parcel uh, sort, of, sort of solved the problem and uh, the panoptic segmentation uh, retrieved the correct uh, semantic class. Um, we also uh, compared the <laughs> panoptic predictions uh, made by, by our model to that of a model trained on a single uh, input uh, image. So to sort of assess the importance of the temporal dimension to, uh, to this task. <clears throat> and we show a qualitative illustration of this here. And what is clear is that so the temporal dimension uh, helps uh, not only to uh, make uh, better uh, semantic predictions, but also helps in in uh, making in predicting correct uh, instance masks. So, one example is here, where we have a parcel uh, that is we have two parcels that are uh, neighboring and of similar uh, color on a sing on a single image. So it's hard for the for the monotemporal model to uh, correctly instantiate this parcel, but adding the temporal dimension to, to our inputs uh, helps the model uh, distinguish between these two uh, neighboring parcels. And we can also see that uh, on the semantic front, the semantic predictions of the monotemporal model were mostly off, whereas they're uh, mostly correct uh, in the multi temporal case. So to wrap up with some uh, uh, other qualitative results, we show here um, the class-wise performance uh, on uh, semantic segmentation in orange and panoptic segmentation in blue. And so what's interesting is that so there, there's sort of consensus uh, on some classes, such as a beet or winter, winter, winter rapeseed, where uh, those classes are well addressed uh, both in semantic and panoptic segmentation. Or some other classes, such as sorghum and uh, mixed cereal, are equally, I mean, not equally, but similarly uh, hard for uh, both uh, problems. But inter interestingly, we have uh, classes such as orchard or meadow or grapevine, which are uh, well addressed in semantic segmentation, but uh, that rank uh, among, among the, the hardest to correctly predict in panoptic segmentation. So this suggests that for these classes, um, Correctly detecting the pre presence of a parcel and um, correctly predicting an instance mask is especially difficult. So, as a conclusion, uh, we've seen in this work, uh, we've introduced the uh, UTAE, so Unit with Temporal Attention Encoder, which is a new uh, encoder for satellite image time series that can be used for uh, semantic segmentation and which sets a new state of the art for these tasks. We also introduced PAPS, parcels as points, which uh, is an instance segmentation module that, uh, when combined with uh, UTAE as backbone, sets the first uh, state of the art for panoptic segmentation of satellite image time series at 40.4 points of panoptic quality. And we released uh, the PASTIS dataset, uh, which we hope will promote further research and uh, promote satellite image time series analysis as a challenging playground for original computer vision algorithms. So all the code and, and data of this work is available on the links below. And to finish with a teaser, uh, we have a follow-up work that we'll uh, re release soon, where we show that the panoptic uh, segmentation of satellite image time series can be improved by leveraging uh, the radar acquisition of uh, Sentinel-1 combined to uh, Sentinel-2 observation in uh, fusion models. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm um, looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Vivian. A uh, question from uh, Charlotte uh, asking you, how do you take into account the uncertainty of the parcel's border uh, in the definition uh, of the RPG, and do you do any geometry pre-processing -pre to ensure its consistency? Sorry, I didn't get the first part of the question. 
Uh, how do you take into account the uncertainty at the parcels border definition in the RPG? Okay, so uh, we we uh, we. So for the parcel boundaries, we uh, perform visual in in inspection uh, on the on the patches that we selected in the in the past dataset, and we we did not uh, see clear delineation uh, errors. Uh, the, we didn't quantify uh, precisely the uncertainty in, in parcel boundary. It's probably in the range of one one centimeter pixel. Um, and for the other question. Um, Sorry, what was it again? If you if you need any geometric pre-processing of the of the RPG to ensure consistency. Okay, so now we don't we don't do geometric pre-processing. We just uh, removed um, parcels that were uh, way too small. So uh, uh, either parcels that were uh, less than one pix um, pixel sentinel two pixel wide in either of their dimensions, for instance. Another question from uh, from Mark. Um, when training on some types within France and testing on others, did you observe a drop in accuracy? So um, the way we so for now we didn't um, we didn't evaluate we didn't evaluate a sort of geographical generalization because uh, the the it, each fold is uh, the patches for each fold are selecting the four different tiles. Of, uh, of the data set. So uh, all the experiments that we've shown here are um, with the training on the, four, on the four tiles and testing and validating on the four tiles as well. So uh, we didn't evaluate that, but all the metadata is available in the past data set. So that's clearly something that can be evaluated and would be interesting, yes. A uh, uh, question from Joachim Niborg. Are the incomplete fields near the border of the input patch a problem for panoptic segmentation? For example, wouldn't you need to link these cut off fields when combining input patches to a complete crop map for the region? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, that's a good question for now. Um, so first one uh, practical point uh, that's shown here. We removed um, from the annotations the parcels that were, so parcels are at the border of a patch that were uh, cut by the patch border uh, were removed if less than 50% of their surface was, uh, was still in the patch. Um, and then practically what this means, um, so, so, the, so the, the, the prediction is not evaluated in, 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 this, uh, in, in these regions. Um, and practically, um, maybe a, a simple solution to this problem would be to uh, to uh, make overlapping patch in in a practical implementation would be to make overlapping patches uh, to ensure that uh, each each zone is at least uh, once not in the uh, not, not in the boundary between two patches. Um, another question from uh, Jakub Dvorak, uh, asking you what is the computational computational complexity of your model. And if you can run the model on a local workstation or a remote server. So um, I, 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 so the, the UTA, uh, we show the inference time here. The, the, those are computed on a V100 Tesla uh, GPU. Um, uh, but it does run for inference only uh, on a on a 1080 um, uh, NVIDIA GPU. Uh, the, I'm not sure we have the inference times for, you know, we don't have, uh, so the um, parcelized points mod module uh, adds, um, so the, the combined architecture UTA and PAPS is around uh, a million and uh, 300 uh, trainable parameters where the, the PAPS module uh, amounts for uh, 300,000 uh, uh, trainable parameters. Uh, also, this this uh, architecture also was trained on a Tesla V100, uh, and uh, but can also run just for inference on, on a more workstation GPU. So I guess the simple answer is like tra training training the, the, these models requires 
server um, server machines, but uh, inference only uh, can be run on workstation GPU. And I'm sure there, there, there could be a lighter parameterization that works uh, not as good, but that can be trained. And how, how, how long uh, does it take to, to do inference on one fold, which is something like 40,000 uh, parcels or 20,000 parcels? Um, so for uh, semantic segmentation, it takes uh, 25 seconds. And uh, for uh, panoptic segmentation, I'm not sure. I don't have the figure in mind. But it's it's uh, it's it's longer because uh, there's a a, ser a series of uh, sequential operations in the in the instant segmentation pipeline, so um, it, it's around two or three times uh, longer. Okay, so around two minutes for twenty thousand parcels uh, yeah. patches. We okay. Yeah. So that's for four hundred patches, right? Two minutes for four hundred pa pa patches. Thank you. Yeah. A uh, question from uh, Virginie about uh, so your teaser on using Sentinel-1. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are using data augmentation uh, in, in general, then would some of that not be available for when working with Sentinel-1? So first of all, are you, are you using data augmentation? And if yes, would it be transferable to Sentinel-1? So in all the experiments that are presented here, we don't use uh, data augmentation. Um, and for the fusion uh, work, we you, you do use a, a data augmentation that is uh, applicable to both Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, and which is simply to uh, drop out uh, randomly some observations of the input sequences. So instead of train, training on the full um, on the full available time series for both uh, satellites, we uh, at each um, at each um, iteration we randomly drop. Uh, certain observations uh, of each time series. Right. But no radiometric uh, uh, augmentation? No. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vivian. And, uh, everybody, so we will reconvene in uh, 10 minutes uh, for a talk uh, by Mark Rosboom on uh, metal learning and uh, uh, Katarina on estimation of a uh, Canopy uh, multi stratum structure and a uh, Felix uh, on learning crop rot rotation with uh, deep learning. So we, we all meet in uh, 10 minutes using the same link. See you.
Mark, if you want to, to share your screen, just check that it works already. Oh, awesome, great. All right, so we start in two minutes. I'll, I'll give a brief introduction and then uh, we start. Perfect, you hear me well? Perfect. Okay, great. All right, so I think we'll start, uh, start again. So uh, thank you, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Rosewom, uh, for being accepted to, to, to speak here. So Mark did his uh, PhD at the Technical University of Munich, and he uh, is now a scientific assistant uh, at OPFL in the Environmental Computational Science and Earth Observation Lab uh, with uh, Davis Tuya. He's going to talk about uh, it's in a very important uh, problem in uh, women's hunting and in machine learning in general today. So, Mark, whatever you want. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk uh, in front of so many people. Um, I will defend my PhD in uh, early next year, and then I will do a postdoc here at uh, the PFL Valais at the lab of Davis Tuya. And the topic that I will be talking about in particular is data driven vegetation modeling. Um, and understanding representation shift based on works that I did with Sherry Wang in 2020, um, and with a focus on model agnostic meta learning and um, future meta learning. And um, first, uh, quick uh, general motivation. We have seen that during the previous presentation as well. Like modeling vegetation is a, is a meaningful application. So it touches several sustainable development goals like zero hunger, climate action and also life on land, since a lot of uh, human life depends on agriculture, animal life on biotopes. And the application that I will be talking about in the uh, introduction and the methods primarily is uh, crop type mapping, uh, which we have seen as well, of mapping a satellite time series data uh, to a crop type label. And uh, later in the meta learning section, it will be a more a general application of land cover classification of mapping satellite image to a particular land cover label. So um, for time series classification, here is one sample from uh, Lucas Kontmann that uh, he will present at the New York State track this year. Um, it is basically the distinction of different crop types um, based on their time series profile. So on the y-axis, we have the NDVI as a um, feature related to photosynthesis and on the x-axis we have the time. And when we look at specific um, field parcels and we look at their profile through time, we see that some classes characteristically change compared to, to other parcels based on their distribution. So we see and highlighted the thick lines, um, the two fields here highlighted, and then we have other samples from uh, the data set highlighted in, in light blue lines. And what we here basically have are samples from a distribution of samples. Um, and the situation now um, is we have satellite time series data in abundance. Like we have MODIS, we have Sentinel, we have Lancet, and we have that on a really global scale. So um, we really don't need to worry about input data. 
And in particular for crop type labels, we also have label, label data in abundance. So um, as Vivi was talking about, it's, uh, France is uh, very good in uh, publishing those crop type labels as 10 million fields. Um, it's about three gigabytes in data. And if we would download all the Sentinel tile, Sentinel-2 um, uh, time series from all the fields, we would get 2.7 terabytes. If we would get it for uh, the entirety of Europe, we would have about 50 terabytes of data. So it's really massive data, big data. So is the problem solved is the question because we have plenty of input data, we have plenty of labeled data. Um, so naively we could say, let's just train a deep neural network on all the data that we have available and we will be fine. But actually what we fall is something that I call here quite informally um, the data dilemma. And we will uh, talk about this more and more uh, precisely later in the following slides. And that is um, whenever we train a model on one particular region, like here in the east of France, um, and we test it on another region, and here in France, we see a significant drop in performance. Um, and this is related to out of distribution or to poor out of distribution generalization. And um, it is quite dramatic and it's not necessarily systematic. So we see here one region that is actually not that bad. Uh, while here the southern France is uh, classified really poorly on a model trained here, actually worse than random. This is a toy data set of 200 samples um, per class per region. And um, those southern France parcels are classified um, at about 30% accuracy and the random classifier would do 50% accuracy. So uh, it's not necessarily very um, predictive when we train on one region how well we will generalize on, on another region. Um, and the underlying uh, cause, especially for vegetation, is pretty clear. It's, in, it's the environment. Photosynthesis is a function of the environment. And when we look at environmental uh, variables like precipitation and temperature, we see that there is a very fine-grained um, difference throughout the entirety of France. And the same goes for the globe and through space and also through time. So what we have here is a situation that our data distribution is basically shift based on space and time. But what we like to do in, on a global scale with more and more data that we have available is we would like to, to take um, data and label data from regions that we have labeled data available, like for crop type mapping, it's Europe and it's United States through the crop data layer. We would like to train our models on this type of data and then we would like to generalize better out of distribution on the other parts of the globe where the collection of the data is actually not that uh, good. And this is the extreme case here, uh, which we tested as the most challenging application at the end, where we would like to train on different regions throughout um, um, like all the other continents and we test in Africa. Um, but to understand and to formalize that a little bit more precisely, let's talk about some idea, like some structure, how we generate data in, in the first place to, to have a more precise understanding of what is going on. And um, we have a domain that is consistent of a input space and a distribution over this input space. And um, the domain is the set of these two things. And we can sample individual um, data points, unlabeled data points from this domain. And then we have a task in mind, which is for instance, a crop type classification. And that is um, a label space of the different crop type labels and a predictive function. And the predictive function maps the input space to the label space. Um, so that we get essentially labeled labeled samples. So each domain and task has an underlying predictive function that maps the input to the target. And this together builds us a joint data distribution, P. And then from this joint data distribution, we sample independently and identically distributed, uh, we sample a data set. Um, because the original domain and the distributions are not accessible to us, only the data set is accessible to us. And then we can use a deep learning neural network um, that takes the input data and the labeled data to basically approximate the predictive function of the task within this domain and task combination in this joint data distribution. So um, Ben David and Charles Schwartz say that quite uh, figuratively that the data set is the window that the learner has to, to see the world. So um, how is this IID assumption usually enforced um, in, in machine learning? And it is very common on a lot of benchmark data sets to have uh, one data sampling process where, we, where one 
one time a larger data set is, is generated. So a large data set is sampled and that is then randomly split into a training and a testing partition. And a random splitting ensures that all the samples are um, identically distributed and they're independently sampled as well. And then we can train our model um, as before, and then we essentially compare it to the predictive function, which is within this joint distribution. And we measure the in-domain and in-distribution generalization. And uh, we do everything basically correctly. We can do multiple cross-validation splits. We can uh, make sure it really generalizes well here. And um, our predictive functions are getting really good for the particular um, task in mind. And this is a very valid framework to test how good can our predictive function approximate the how, how good can our model approximate the predictive function within this domain and task. But very often when we have a real, a real world application where we would like to apply something um, on an open world problem, for instance, for chatbots, it's when you put it on the internet and suddenly people start to write on it uh, in an interactive way, you see unforeseen situations. And uh, we basically get data from another distribution, um, which is not the same domain and not the same task. And then what we do is our model that very well generalizes within this IID machine learning framework suddenly is compared to a different predictive function that it has never seen before. And then the um, accuracy basically drops because we are essentially comparing apples with pies to some degree. And this is our out of domain or out of distribution generalization. And so if we bring the example from, uh, from here, we see that we're not doing anything wrong in training and testing here in, uh, in this one particular region, we fulfill all the requirements that we usually have with the IID assumption. Um, but this is of little value, in, especially on Earth-related situations where we usually would like to generalize beyond that. Um, but then whenever we would like to test the model on some other distribution, uh, we suddenly have to deal with the situation that we essentially violate this assumption of identical distribution um, to, to run to some degree or to other. And to some regions we violated less and to others we violated more. And so the question is how, to, how can we um, improve on the target task? And the naive way of doing that is to ignore all the source data and see each data set as completely separate and just focus on the target tasks, sample hopefully enough data so we can split that again randomly and then we we train the model, but that is often not feasible. First, it's not very um, useful because when we need data, it's not very valuable to predict there as well in one particular region, for instance. Um, and second, the data sets can be fairly small because uh, the idea of domain shift is like, it's a continuous process. Um, so the next step is um, to go into a more general transfer learning framework where we have some source knowledge that we can use to project on the target knowledge. And one simple way of doing uh, this transfer learning um, is to do a pre-training. So we combine all the source um, data that we have available, we do a random split, we train our model, we make sure it generalizes well in distribution, and then we have an initialization that encodes, encodes already some knowledge about the problem at hand. Um, and then we use that as an initialization for our um, for our target task. And then we can fine tune it on the predictive function of that target task. And then we, uh, we are essentially already better. And there's been quite some work on this under, under the general framework of domain adaptation. There's some model-based, instance-based, feature-based ideas how to, how to implement this. But the one that I will be talking about here is um, the meta-learning framework. That is a general idea that extends um, uh, the IID machine learning by relaxing this non-identical joint distribution assumption. Um, and the idea here is to accept that our data is not necessarily from one distribution, but from many distributions. So I denote this here, the source tasks and domains as a uh, key and I denotes the individual distribution. And in each of these source um, tasks and domains, we sample a data set and we can randomly split that IID into training and test partitions. Um, and then we have some weights that are also first initially uh, randomly initialized. We use that to initialize uh, a model, um, fine tune it on a batch of different source um, tasks and domains, make sure it generalizes. And then the key part here is to update not only the fine tuned weights, but update two steps to go back to the original meta weights over a batch of tasks and domains. 
And so what we get then is another initialization, which is then explicitly optimized to adapt to some uh, new tasks, uh, tasks and domains. And that can be then used on a new set of tasks and domains. So each of them is represented by a data set, um, which is then fine-tuned with few samples of each uh, distribution on the particular target. Excuse me. Uh, maybe that was. Uh... I'll just carry on, carry on. Okay. Um, so let's go one step deeper and look a bit on a visual side on, on what we're doing to understand the algorithm. Um, so we have three uh, task and domains here, and each has a predictive function um, where we can uh, sample data from. And the model agnostic meta learning algorithm first samples a batch of tasks. So those are the three here. And each of those predictive functions are best, um, uh, best tackled by one particular set of weights. So we have a set of uh, model weights. Um, and then we um, sample data from each uh, different uh, task within this batch of tasks. Separately, we calculate, we do the forward pass, we calculate the gradients. Um, and then we fine tune the adaptive parameters to three different uh, sets of weights. Um, and then the next step here is to evaluate the test loss on the sec uh, different testing partition that was randomly split. And then we do this double update where we go back to the fine tuned representation and the second order gradient back to the original weights. And then what we get is uh, we update the original meta learned parameters. Um, and so what we get is when we have a new task, a new source, a uh, target task here, we have a model that is optimized to adapt well based on the source distribution. And when we compare that to a regular pre-training where we sample from each of those distributions, like we combine them and we sample data from them in a combined way, we have here a model that is optimized to perform well on the source distributions. And this is essentially the key difference of, of meta learning, that here the model is explicitly optimized by the loss function to adapt, to be fine-tuned. So um, let's go over some experiments. And um, we tested three different uh, data sets uh, with quite different outcomes. And I would like to start with one where model agnostic meta learning did not perform very well initially. So we looked at um, a deep globe data set, which was a CVPI, it's a segmentation, a land cover segmentation problem um, of different images. Um, so each of those images. Uh, the task is to segment that into a certain uh, range of land cover labels. And we assume now here to put it in this meta learning framework that each of those images has its own task and domain. So um, each of those images is a different task and domain where, we, where the pixels are basically um, samples from. And then we split each image into a support and a query partition or a train and a test partition, um, IID randomly. Um, and then we take one subpart from the support side, uh, from the support tiles, and we adapt the model to this one particular image, um, and then evaluate the performance on the query tiles. So it's a few shot adaptation problem here as well. And then we put some images into the meta training tasks, and some in the meta validation tasks, and some in the meta test tasks. And what we see here is that um, model agnostic meta learning didn't perform better than random pre training. Like it both performed much better than random initialization, which makes sense because you need many gradient steps to, to update a, a deep neural network, especially a 2D CNN, even though it was a quite simple 2D CNN. Um, but here, the pre trained model performed um, quite well from, from the get go. And uh, compared to the with a meta learned model that uh, slowly caught up but never really outperformed it. And when we look at the, our assumptions that each image here comes from a different uh, joint data distribution, uh, we can test that by doing a dimensionality reduction and look at the principal components. And here we see that you know, the meta train, meta one and meta test uh, images don't vary very systematically. Um, so, uh, our underlying assumption that the distributions may be different uh, are not the case necessarily here. And so to test this, we 
um, split them in a characteristic way. So we took all the green images in the meta train partition, for instance, all the orange images in the meta wild partition, and to basically make it more difficult for a classical machine learning model that is trained IID on assumption of one big distribution. And what we see here is that the pre-trained model um, does very poorly, like the accuracy drop is quite dramatic because we are essentially training on apples and we're testing on pies. And then in this case, we see that the MAMA model also has a more difficult time because it's a more difficult problem, but it starts to outperform quite uh, the, the pre-trained model from a quite get-go. And also the random initialization actually gets, gets better than pre-training. So there can be a negative uh, part of it as well if we find the regular pre-training and fine-tuning. So let's go on a more global scale and look at the send one to ms data set, which is actually where we actually know that the data is globally distributed, while on the deep globe data, uh, it was um, it's very likely that the training and the validation set that we used basically was from the same region. Um, and here we have um, 144 different uh, regions on the globe which we then um, separate into training, validation, and test regions. And each region is basically one large scene of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data, which we then split into different smaller tiles for training and uh, testing, or query and support. And when we look at this land cover classification problem, we see that on without any adaptation at zero shot, the pre-trained model performed quite, uh, quite good, which makes sense since it's optimized to perform well on all source regions simultaneously. Um, and not necessarily on the adaptation. And the MAML model at zero without adaptation doesn't do very well, which makes sense. It's not optimized on that. But then if we just see one sample from each of the, um, of the regions in the, the test, like one part of the uh, test regions, we see that the MAML model actually did better um, co compared to the pre-trained model. And this is consistent, um, it kind of flattens out, but it's quite consistent throughout multiple shots and also for the classification case and the segmentation case um, as well. And now let's look to the third problem that we looked at, um, which is the most challenging of them. We have we looked at modest time series um, data and we use land cover labels because they are globally available as well. So the task was we have a satellite time series so from, from modest and we would like to get the um, time series data as well. And we sample different boxes around the globe and we specifically split the training regions in blue and the test regions in red. And it's a really challenging problem because uh, the representations here in Africa are really uh, different to the rest of the globe and it's, uh, and, and we have, um, and we really test the adaptation here. And we show, we see that it's quite mixed. So here on the rows, we can see the training from scratch, the fine tuning, pre-training and the meta learning and different metrics here on the, on the columns. And I will focus here on the Kappa statistic because um, it shows us quite clearly when a model actually did something useful or not because a random, it compares it to the random classification. So at zero. So when we look at the average, uh, the mean performances over all of those 515 um, test boxes in Africa, we see that the MAMA model uh, did a little bit better, but it's really not good. Um, like the accuracy is, says it's good, but it's because it's a binary classification problem because it's a two-way few shot problem um, with 70%. Uh, random classification is 50. Um, and we can see when we plot the histogram of how many tasks did good, how many tasks like good parts are here, how many tasks, how many regions did poorly, we can see that um, this is basically driven by few of the uh, regions in Africa that where the adaptation actually worked. And that only happened really in the MAMA case, while the random initialization is kind of the baseline, but here also the pre-training, there was none region that really performed well after, after adaptation. Um, but still a vast majority of the tasks basically failed and predicted randomly. Um, so we can see um, kind of a mix back here that there is some potential, but the task is also incredibly difficult. Um, for the, for the adaptation. So in general, what do we learn from it? And I'm taking this from the uh, transfer learning book of Yang and Pan, uh, which was published 2020, so fairly recent. And they ask the question, when, when to transfer? Because it's a transfer learning problem where we would like to use knowledge from some source domains on a target domain. And I think we see 
a few cases here. Like first, if the distributions are too similar, transfer learning is not really necessary. So we, I think we saw that in a deep cloud unclustered um, experiment. If the distributions are related, um, transfer learning is effective or it can be effective. Um, I think we have one experiment which falls into this category. But if they are too different, um, if there's really no common knowledge to be learned, um, then uh, transfer learning is not, um, not effective as well. And I think that happens on the majority of the modest time series tasks, while well, some adapted, but I would not, like it's still an open question. So to, to wrap up, um, like this problem of out of distribution generalization, it remains still very, gen very challenging. I think this is a thing that will be a research topic for the next years um, as well. And also few shot meta learning is, is well suited for some cases, especially when we have many, when we can assume that we have many uh, small distributions or many distributions globally distributed oh. optimally quite uniformly. Uh, with few samples per, per individual data set. Um, and we may need to decide on a learning framework on a case by case basis. And this kind of goes in a general theme. So I want to give an example here from a project that, that I've been involved in over the last year as well. Uh, it's marine litter detection, where we have um, different sites around the globe as well. We would look like to um, perform good on each of those uh, regions and the representations change as well in each of those regions. There's slightly different objects, different atmospheric conditions. So it's also a, we would like to still use some of the regions to be better on the other. And we find some quite similar problems that uh, um, our cross validation scores are kind of variance is quite, quite large if we take some bag of them for training and others for testing. But then here, it's not a few shot problem. Uh, we have two classes, we have multiple samples. Um, so what we do here is we, we go into a contrastive learning pre-training direction and see if that improves the overall accuracy. And as a kind of last um, direction, what I think is, a, is, is what we're going towards, like about until a few years ago, we were mostly thinking about what features um, should we use, like uh, the classic remote sensing and DVI feature or what pre-processing is necessary. Then we transition into this uh, phase where we ask like, what are the best suited deep learning models for a particular application? And I think now is a big question as well, how can we improve the learning algorithm we want and how, how do we test our assumptions, especially this assumption of identical data distribution? And there's still an open question, um, which maybe have to be decided on a case by case basis. And that's, my presentation and uh, thank you very much. I would like to promote our thematic session on time series together with uh, Charlotte, Pelletier and Joe Ju as well. Um, and uh, I hope it was interesting and I'm um, looking forward for, for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. So a lot of questions. Uh, first, a uh, uh, very good remark by uh, Ilias Tsumas that uh, meteo and weather is a very important latent variable behind uh, um, special domain shift. So the question is, we talk about special and temporal encoding, but what about material and weather encoding? Is there a state of the art solution to integrate this type of information in a deep learning pipeline for uh, agricultural yeah. auto tasks, but also probably other tasks would, be, would benefit from it? Yeah, there, it's a very good point. Like we have, we have this auxiliary data as well, like meteorologic variables. And um, there are different ways to combine them. Like the easiest one is to put them as input variables as well. Um, but they can also be used as a guiding system to, to bridge the gap from one distribution to, to the next one, which is mostly used in like a few short learning or zero short learning framework. So there are different ways to integrate this. Um, and it depends on the particular use case, um, but the motivation here was to, to investigate this general problem in the first place. So we explicitly didn't integrate the, the meteorologic variables, but it's probably going to improve if we would like to, to get, especially in, in France, a more uniform, um, uniform predictions. Thank you. A uh, question about uh, the weight, weight sharing uh, strategy. So do you apply the metal learning on all the parameters uh, of all the network? Or, um, so Mathieu asked, uh, um, so he, he would he thinks that you could 
share the encoding weights and is not certain whether or not uh, this is shared between the various tasks. So is the encoder weights shared or is it just the decoders of the various tasks? Like the, the models that we used were comparatively simple. So for the classification, it was a few layers in N. Um, and it's the entire weights that are basically adapted. Um, but as uh, Caesar also points out, there is MAML++, for instance, mm -hmm. um, that learns different learning rates for each of the layers separately. Because if you think about the CNN of dif different layers as well, like uh, when you change the, the labels for each different task, the last layer will have to change more than the first few layers, which are more for the geometric features. So it makes sense to um, adapt some parts of the model um, faster or with larger learning rates um, compared to like the first layer, which probably gonna stay the same for the um, for, for more tasks. And MAML++ is a development on top of MAML um, that builds on this idea and, uh, and learns different learning rates um, for each layer separately, which is a good idea. So uh, related a uh, question by uh, Cesar, who is uh, Abia, so ask why, um, if you consider MAMI++ or meta SGD or either higher order, other higher order data derivatives, maybe uh, prohibitive for your applications. And also, did you use, a, did you try production, prototyp prototypical network operation nets yeah. for, for the future learning settings? Yeah, um, like what I presented is like the results from 2020 and recently we restarted that um, and we kept on going a little bit, but things have just moved on um, over the last year. Um, we have some experiments with MAML++ prototypical networks and ProtoMAML as well. And we see that they work better than like the original MAML. Um, but it's the same underlying situation. Like um, prototypical networks um, map it into a meaningful feature space. So they're a bit different, but um, like, um, there are different ways to achieve this, but the underlying takeaway of that we have to deal with those different distributions on each region, this is the, the main idea that I would like wanted to, to convey here. Um, but if you're starting this, probably looking at um, ProtoMaml and MAML++ is probably a good start as well, because they, on the, on the Omniglot benchmark data sets, they outachieve MAML. Thank you. Um, have you considered or tried to use self-supervised uh, pre-training to increase the generalization and globally distributed mm -hmm. uh, unenabled data? Yeah, that's a good point as well, because it kind of goes in the same um, same problem space. Um, this uh, contrastive pre-training, we, we hand define a task beforehand that we can craft in a specific way that we don't need labels, for instance, or we can craft it in a specific way that we would like to make objects more similar to each other, on, on, like images, for instance. And that is then a good initialization for, for the particular target application. Um, so it kind of tackles the same like um, problem, but in a very different, um, different ideas, where you can use much larger models, where you basically hunt, define your, your P source tasks, and then you fine tune on your Q target tasks. Um, and for the marine litter detection, that's essentially what we're going for um, now that uh, we, we sample unsupervised, uh, uh, unlabeled data because we have it available um, and we, we do this for pre-training. Thank you. A question from uh, Conrad Schindler asking, uh, how much more compute intensive is meta learning in your setting? And I would add also, I'm curious about the memory impact compared mm, to normal in, approach. In terms of memory, it's not super um, much more. The problem is whether the implementation framework and the way we structure the data set. Um, like the problem with like the classical normal is we have these second order gradients. So we propagate back to the fine-tuned representation and then back to the meta weights. And something like, oh, my headphones just died. I hope you can still hear me. We can. Uh, okay. Um, and um, Torch, for instance, um, doesn't, um, doesn't allow second order, order gradients. Um, so these, uh, you have to basically do a functional forward where you pass the weights into the model um, separately to do the fine tuning, and then you can use a regular torch optimizer for the for the meter rates. There are some other frameworks, but going away from Python is, is like like Yaxis, for instance, one. But that is basically a challenge, um, and it's uh, generally not a method to really plug and play. Um, 
So it really needs to fit the the problem at hand. Like if it's a few short situation where you have many small data sets that are kind of related with only a few samples per per example um, that can kind of inform each other. So would the training be much longer um, to train the meta with a meta learning compared to pre-trained from scratch, for example, for your tests? Um, well, it depends. Yeah, well, it depends on the size of the data set. So when we trained our models, that was all quite doable. Um, also on the stand one trainers that all ran within a night or two. Um, but the models used for the meta learning, also for the benchmarks, are quite are much smaller compared to the models that you would use for contrastive learning or pre-training. Like you don't, um, like none of the MAML or MAML plus plus methods use a big ResNet. Um, they all use quite small CNNs uh, where you can do the second order gradients. Um, so this is basically the limitation here. Um, but the idea is also um, that uh, by being able to adapt to a new data distribution, your your actual function doesn't have to be so so much more com uh, complex. So if you you can think about a deep neural network as a massively uh, complex function that can approximate a lot of uh, a lot of different representations, and if we do pre-training, we kind of encode all of those different distributions within like the larger network weights, um, but uh, that's not necessarily the, the goal to go for with like this few short uh, meta learning setting. It's rather really small, um, small models that can be adapted. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question uh, by Cesar Luis Aybar. Uh, what strategy did you use to divide uh, your support on query uh, data set? What rational uh, did you use to split uh, um, your data set into support on query? Yeah, that's, that's random sampling. Like within each... <clears throat> Within each task, we, we kind of have the full IID assumption that we say we uh, randomly split the data from this task into main into a training and a testing petition, so a support and a query petition. So we can do basically random splitting there. But the, the, the idea that this identical distribution assumption is relaxed is between the individual tasks and distributions. Um, and then here we the different splits, like we with San Ventura Invest, we, did, we split the regions um, randomly and then with the modus we, split, we took out the Africa specifically. Okay, well thank you, thank you so much, that's very interesting. I'm very interested in this, <laughs> this line of work. Um, Katrina, if you want to yes. share your screen. Okay. Um... Great. Uh, okay. So I just introduced uh, you. No, <laughs> is it full screen or oh, no? It's not full. Not full screen. No. Uh, boop, boop. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Perfect. So uh, Katrina uh, Inshiva did her PhD at PSEP and is now a postdoc uh, at uh, the Elastic Ingen Ingen with Inray and is working uh, um, in my team. You can start. Uh, so hello, uh, my name is Ekaterina and uh, I'm going to present you our algorithm for vegetation stratum occupancy prediction from airborne LiDAR 3D point clouds. Uh, so uh, the goal of our algorithm is to estimate the vegetation coverage ratio of different vegetation strata, uh, lower, medium and higher. So this information is uh, essential for pasture land management and especially for estimating the vegetation surface that is accessible for pasture animals. And so this is uh, the, um, uh, the initial uh, use of our algorithm, but also uh, this algorithm can be, can be used for other tasks such as, uh, for example, forest management or welfare modeling. Uh, so given a study plot, uh, so our algorithm should be able to classify points into four different classes. Um, such as um, bare soil, uh, low vegetation, medium vegetation, and high vegetation. And then um, it should produce vegetation occupancy maps for three different vegetation strata, uh, lower, medium, and higher. So uh, here you can see an example of a study plot uh, with different vegetation types. Uh, so the lower stratum is uh, 
covered at 50% by bare soil on the left and by 50% by uh, low vegetation on the right. Uh, so the medium stratum is um, is presented by by some bushes that are located on on the right side of the plot and they roughly cover uh, twenty five percent of the of the medium stratum. And finally, the higher stratum uh, is covered at ten percent by by a tree. And also, it's um, uh, by a tree that. Uh, that is located here and also you have to um, uh, we have to take into the account that for example the tree trunks uh, they do not participate in the in the vegetation coverage so actually uh, the whole task is is uh, is a bit is a bit more complicated than than it seems uh, so concerning the data we use, uh, we have uh, 199 uh, circular pots of 10 meter radius and so the data that we have is presented in the shape of uh, 3D point clouds uh, that were acquired by, by airborne LiDAR combined with multispectral sensors. Uh, so the point density of our, uh, of our point clouds are 10 pulses per, uh, per square meter. And so uh, each point uh, of the point cloud has nine features such as um, uh, it's 3D coordinates, uh, RGB and um, near infrared reflectance values, uh, the intensity of the of the return signal and and the return number. Um, so it's it's important to say that um, that we develop our model for for small plots, but at the end uh, we will use our model to map uh, uh, much bigger vegetation parcels. Uh, so the ground truth that we have for our model um, uh, was annotated by a human expert in situ, which is actually quite rare. And also at the same time, it would be uh, quite complicated to produce the ground truth uh, without being on the, uh, on the ground. Uh, so for each plot, uh, we only have three, three aggregated values that, that express the, the vegetation coverage for each stratum. Uh, and this value, uh, this value, they vary from uh, zero percent, uh, which means that uh, there is no vegetation in in the vegetation strata, and uh, to one hundred percent. That means that uh, that the strata is totally covered by vegetation. And so these ground truth values are quite approximate, and they can take only nine discrete values, such as zero uh, percent, ten percent, twenty five percent, and etc. Uh, so, as I've said, uh, the ground truth data is aggregate, aggregated per plot and we actually do not have any pointwise annotations. And however, uh, the final results of our algorithm, they, they should contain the pixel-wise predictions uh, in, in the form of coverage map. And so, to deal with this problem, we, we propose to use uh, a weekly supervised learning algorithm uh, so in uh, in machine learning we have uh, three different degrees of supervision. So uh, we have supervised learning, and in case of supervised learning, the model is trained with uh, with some label data, and then uh, we use the model to to make the predictions on on some new new unla unlabeled data. Uh, then we have unsupervised learning. In in the unsupervised learning, the ma uh, the model is trained uh, without any labels. And then we use the model to, to make the predictions on the same data it was trained on. And finally, uh, there is weekly supervised learning. And in, in the case of the of weekly supervised learning, the model is trained uh, with data with a limited or and uh, or or and uh, indirect annotations. And so, for example, like in our case, we have only three aggregated values per plot, but at the same time, we, we tend to produce uh, uh, pixel precise occupancy maps. And so uh, the main advantage of, uh, for, of these weekly supervised algorithms is that the ground truth is actually is quite easy to produce and it's also cheap to produce. Uh, but at the same time, the results of the algorithm are quite satisfying. Uh, so uh, how, does our, uh, how does our algorithm works? Uh, so uh, we have uh, for each plot we have uh, we have a point cloud of n points 
and each of these points has nine features. And so, first of all, uh, we take a simple uh, point net to deep learning model and we make the predictions uh, that each point belongs to one of or to one of four classes, uh, bare soil, uh, lower vegetation, medium vegetation and higher vegetation. Uh, so uh, after the uh, so uh, we obtain a point cloud uh, of n points and each point has four features that correspond uh, to the to the class scores and all these features they sum up to one so uh, then uh, for each stratum uh, we take the corresponding uh, the corresponding probabilities uh, the corresponding predictions and we project um, and we project these predictions to uh, to uh, to the corresponding strata uh, so uh, each point is uh, is projected on the uh, on the raster along the vertical axis and so uh, each pixel of the each pixel of the occupancy map it can take from uh, from zero to to several points depending on the on the density of the point cloud and so the final uh, the final value of the of the occupancy map is uh, computed as the maximum value of the points that uh, fall into this pixel. Uh, so after this procedure, we, we obtain uh, three, uh, three occupancy maps for, for three vegetation strata. And so we compute the, we compute the, the aggregated, uh, we compute the mean value for, uh, per, per, each, uh, per each strata. And then uh, we use our ground truth to, to supervise the model. Uh, so this model uh, has uh, several problems. Uh, the first problem is that um, uh, point classification into each stratum may be inconsistent. So it means that um, actually nothing stops a point that is located at four meter to, to be classified as soil, for example. And the second problem is that um, the aggregated occupancy predictions may be correct. But at the same time, the predicted maps, they tend to be blurry uh, or unrealistic. So, um, so it means that uh, it, all the pixels of the occupancy maps, they can take uh, the same values that, corresponds, uh, that already corresponds to the, to the aggregated uh, plot value. Uh, so to, to solve these problems, we, we propose to use uh, three last functions to, to optimize our model. Uh, so, uh, the first loss function is the data loss, and it assures that the aggregated values are correct. So for this uh, for this loss function, we use the, the simple L1 norm loss or absolute mean error. Uh, so the second loss is the elevation loss, and it assures that the stratum predictions are consistent with the points height. And so for this, we perform the now, for this loss, we perform the explicit stratum elevation modeling, and I will detail it, uh, detail it later. And so uh, the third loss is uh, the entropy loss, and it forces the algorithm to, to produce uh, the raster maps with pixel values close to, to zero or one. So in other words, it allows uh, to produce more realistic occupancy maps. And uh, so for this, uh, we use the average average uh, image uh, entropy minimization. Uh, so as I said, um, uh, we perform explicit uh, stratum elevation modeling so that the algorithm forces predictions to be consistent with elevations. Uh, so we simplify the task and we consider that there are only two stratum. Uh, so uh, there is a stratum one that corresponds to, to lower stratum and stratum two that corresponds to uh, medium and uh, higher strata. And so our strata that uh, they're modeled as as a mixture, mixture of two gamma distributions. Um, and this mixture is learned with expectation maximization algorithm uh, that, that does not need any, any human supervision. And so on this figure, uh, you can see uh, our point elevation distribution. Uh, so, and actually we can easily interpret the, the two components of the distribution. Uh, so uh, the low elevation density peak on the left, it corresponds to the, to the lower stratum. So it corresponds to, 
to bare soil and uh, lower vegetation. And so the, the high density uh, long tail peak, it corresponds to, to, to medium and high vegetation. Uh, so uh, how do we compute the, uh, the corresponding elevation loss function? Uh, so using the class predictions that we obtained uh, with our point net model, um, we compute the probability that a point belongs to, to a stratum given the ensemble of observations X. So as you can see, it's just the, the sum of the, of the class predictions. So then at the next step, uh, we compute the probability that a point belongs to a stratum S and is located at the, at the elevation Z. So in our work, uh, we make a hypothesis that, uh, that it can be done by using the, the graphical distribution model that I, showed, that I showed to you before. And so the probability, um, and this probability is computed as, uh, as a multiplication of the probability uh, that a point belongs to a stratum given the ensemble of observation X and uh, the probability density that, that, uh, that is compute, uh, computed from, from the distribution model. Uh, so as the next step, we compute the likelihood um, uh, as the sum of these uh, probabilities for, for both strata. And finally, uh, the elevation loss is expressed um, uh, as the negative log, uh, log likelihood. Uh, and so we tend to minimize this negative log likelihood during the model optimization. Um, so to evaluate the performance of our algorithm, we compare it to two different approaches. Uh, so the first approach is the handcrafted approach uh, that is based on simple random forest algorithm. And uh, so this algorithm uses the elevation and the feature values. And the second approach is uh, is a simple point net baseline uh, that directly produces uh, the, uh, the, uh, the occupancy values as the, as the output of, of the model. And so, as you can see, uh, even the simple regression produces quite, quite good results. And of course, it's, um, it's faster than, uh, than our deep learning models. Uh, also, you can see that the point net baseline uh, gives almost uh, as good results as is our model, but uh, the advantage of, of our model is that it produces the, uh, the visual results, so it produces the occupancy maps. Um, so here you can see some, some qualitative uh, results. So unfortunately, we do not have any ground truth occupancy maps. So we just, uh, we just check the, the visual resemblance of the maps to, to the point clouds. And so, uh, as you can see, the produced occupancy maps, uh, they look quite realistic. And so, for example, the plot on, on the left, it has only the lower vegetation. Uh, so, and you can see that uh, half, of the, half of the lower, uh, lower strata is covered by, by the vegetation. And so the, the algorithm correctly predicts uh, the vegetation location and it correctly uh, computes how much vegetation there is on the lower strata. So you, you can see that, um, uh, that the, the occupancy map is colored green on, uh, on the left here. And, and also you can see that the algorithm correctly produces that there is no vegetation in, in two other uh, strata. So on the right, you can see um, uh, you can see another plot um, that has vegetation at uh, all the three levels. Again, um, you can see that the predicted results are quite good. And also you can see that uh, the algorithm produced, uh, the algorithm predict, uh, predicted much more vegetation in the higher stratum than in, than in the medium stratum. And it means that, that the algorithm understood that the, the tree trunks do not participate in, in the vegetation coverage. Um, so to conclude, um, I have presented you a deep learning approach for the prediction of uh, vegetation strata occupancy. And so comparatively to the manual approach, our algorithm was 30% more accurate. 
and yet uh, the model itself it was quite simple and easy to reproduce so uh, moreover our model also produces explicit and interpretable visual results and finally uh, to train our model uh, we use plot aggregated ground truth values that uh, are, that are quite easy to produce contrary to the to the point wise annotations um, that's it thank you oops Thank you, uh, Katrina. So uh, I was asked a question, does your model only work if um, the terrain is flat? Uh, no, uh, it, it can work. Uh, it works for any type of, uh, of terrain, but um, um, in our work, uh, we perform the, um, the, elevation norm uh, the elevation normalization. So we perform it uh, the plot level and for so for each plot for each point we take the the circle or neighborhood and we uh we subtract the the maximum value of the neighborhood so it it allows us to to flatten the 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 plot okay thank you and um would this approach work with a terrestrial lidar instead of an aerial lidar oh why not <laughs> Maybe it would be even, even better. <laughs> trend, but I think it would. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, oh, great. And um, maybe can you, if you, since we have a couple of minutes left, can you maybe uh, tell a word about uh, the next part of uh, this project? Next. Uh, the next step. Uh, what, we're trying, what we are trying to do next be beyond the simple uh, ah. occupancy prediction. Yeah, uh, so also the, the next step of this project will be to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to perform the primitivization of the, of the trees. And so uh, for, for the study area, we have the, um, uh, the, annotated, uh, the annotated tree instances, and we are going to, uh, to, to represent them as the primitive. So as, and when the, the primitivization is done, we, we are going to, uh, uh, to, to create a model that, that are able to, to, to detect uh, all, the, all the trees of the plot and to, to represent them as the primitives. And so uh, once we have this primitivization, we, we are going to, uh, we will be able to, to basically compute anything that, uh, and, any information about the, the, the study area. Particularly uh, biomass and carbon stock and stuff like this. Uh, thank you, uh, Katrina. We'll now move on to the last uh, speaker. Thank you so much for the people who, who are still here. Uh, Felix, if you're here. Yes, uh, can, you hear, can you hear me? Yes. Um, Catherine, if you can no, stop, I, I stop have some sharing. problems with the Zoom because I, I yeah I'm trying to 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 resolve it but it doesn't work yeah I, I'm uh, okay can you see my okay. screen I, yeah we can I was, um, perfect so uh, Felix uh, is a student of UNSG, the school of uh, IGN, and uh, he was my uh, intern uh, this year and uh, he was able to do uh, internship on right uh, technical report that uh, was both an uh, uh, internship report and a technical report for the Ministry of Agriculture at the same time, which was not easy, but uh, he managed to do it. So, Felix, you can talk about your work now. So, um, hello everyone. So, I present my work on modeling crop rotations uh, with deep learning. So, this work has been conducted uh, in the Elastic Laboratory as a French mapping agency and supervised by Loic. So, um, to give uh, some context, uh, we wish to do uh, automatic classifications, um, automatic crop classification, sorry, uh, thanks to satellite images. So there are different kinds of applications, uh, like uh, crop monitoring, for instance, uh, declarations assistant for farmers, and uh, detections of data entry errors. So uh, currently, the best classification models are models trained on a single year data, which is an issue uh, when those models are tested on data from other sources. Um, those models are unable to, unable to generate temporally and their performance, decre their performance decreases a lot. 
So that's why uh, the objective of this project was to estimate the interest of modeling uh, crops over several years at a time, in other words, to handle temporal uh, domain internship. To, to handle temporal, do, temporal domain internship. So um, during this project, we have used uh, Sentinel-2 optical satellite uh, multispectral images at a resolution of uh, 10 meters per pixel. And our study area is the Sri one TF Empire, uh, which is located in the east of France and contains uh, 100,000 stable parcels, which means a parcel where the geographic parameters doesn't change over the studied years for the 20 considered classes. Concerning the temporal scope, we are working from uh, on three years, from uh, 2018 to 2020. And our ground truth um, is based on the farmers, uh, the farmers' declarations contained uh, in the LPIS uh, database concerning main crops and data. So, um, we first we started by doing a quick step of the art of multi-year analysis. Um, our problematic was uh, how to modelize crop rotations. To give a quick definition of uh, crop rotations, uh, crop rotations. This is a very frequent practice uh, used by farmers, which consists in uh, alternating from year to year uh, the cultivated crops on the same parcel in order to keep good yields. So, for instance, if you have a barley, wheat, wheat uh, barley, uh, rapeseed, and wheat at your one. Then at your two, you can have uh, wheat, barley, and rapeseed, and finally uh, rapeseed, wheat, and barley. Um, so um, we think that um, if uh, crop rotations have a huge influence on yields, uh, so modeling them will be beneficial for crop classifications. classifications. So we study the different kinds of methods that can be found to model uh, crop rotations. So first, we have expert models uh, based on the implementation of good practices and the expertise, the expertise of people working in the, in the domain. Then we have the probabilistic approach uh, with Markovian chains, uh, Markov chains and a conditional random field, for instance. And finally, we have deep learning with a residual neural, neural networks, for instance. So currently, the best approach um, is the third one. Um, but what stands out the most uh, of this state of the art is the importance of choosing a high performing single yearly model. Uh, which will be adapted as a multi-year model. So uh, that's why we have done a state-of-the-art of, the art of uh, single year temporal analysis. Here our problematic was uh, how our image time series processed over one year. And here we found the traditional machine learning with SVM random forest and hidden Markov model. And uh, of course, deep learning with uh, Tom CNN, with dual neural networks again, and a temporal attention model, which will be used uh, for this project. So. We chose to use the PCTE model developed by uh, Vivian that uh, already speaked as a single year model and to adapt it as a multi year model. In reality, we used um, the lightweight version of this model. So I'll be quick since uh, some um, Charlotte and Vivian already talked uh, about it, but this model is composed of, of two sub models the pixel set encoder as a temporal, uh, the temporal attention encoder. So this is currently the state of the art in terms of accuracy. Uh, it is three times faster than a visual neural network approach. Um, it uh, beat them with um, 300 times fewer parameters, and it's four times less memory consuming than CNNs. So that's why this is this model we choose to adapt uh, into a multi year model. Um, now, um, during this project, we've conducted two main experiments. So, first, we wanted to know. Uh, if training a model on several years of data is beneficial. For that, we compare uh, two kinds of training protocol. Uh, a unique model is trained um, on three years of cumulative data uh, and three specialized models, uh, which are three identical but independent models are trained on one year uh, each. So the unique model uh, will be referred as uh, a mixed for mixture data and uh, this model, uh, for this model, each, each parcel is present three times in the training data, uh, each one corresponding to one year of acquisition, but uh, there is no direct link between these, those parcels. So um, for the model, it's like if it was three different parcels. Um, so our hypothesis will be that um, a unique model is exposed to more data, which will uh, improve its generation capacity. So if we take a look at the results on this uh, huge table of uh, 16 values, uh, you, you have the column uh, corresponding to the years of acquisitions uh, of the tested data and the rows corresponding to the evaluating model. So
So for instance, U01 column 1 uh, correspond to the MIOU of uh, the specialized models over 2018, but tested on 2018 data. Column 2 is for 2019 and column 3 for 2020. The last column is the performance over three years. Uh, and if you look at the first row, uh, you can see that the M2018 model get good results over 2018 with 64.7 uh, MIOU, but with a 20% uh, of MIOU uh, on the other years, which gives uh, um, a performance over three years of uh, 49.1. And this is the same for the specialized model. So with 48 and uh, 54, uh, 54. So we see that those models are unable to generate temporally. But now if we look at the last uh, row, we can see that the MX models uh, get um, good results over the three years with a performance over three years of 70.4 MIOU, which confirms the hypothesis of generalizations, which is in reality not very surprising uh, since the model is exposed to more data. But more interesting though, if we compare the MX model um, uh, to the specialized models on the year of specializations, uh, here and here, uh, you can see that the MX model beat them. So for instance, uh, when tested on 2018, the M2018 model gets uh, 64.7 against 69.2 for, for the MX model. So this means that the MX model is able to extract deeper information uh, from multi-year data, which is very interesting. And on top of getting a better performance, um, this model might be improved each year with the newly available data, which is uh, one good thing. Um, so now, um, to understand what happened, we use the TSME, uh, which is a tool um, allowing to give 2D representations of higher dimension data. So we use this tool on two models, um, M2020 and MX, and uh, to compare the outputs. So uh, here for 10 classes, you have the representation of some uh, parcel for the M2020 model over the three years, each color corresponding to one class and each kind of figure to a year. So we can see that classes tend to be grouped uh, into clusters um, like sunflower uh, and vineyard here in uh, purple and red. But two things can be noted, noticed here. First is to, if you look at the blue ellipse, um, you can see a big cluster containing three classes uh, with tritical and y, um, which means that the model isn't able to learn specific re representations of those three classes. But now if we looked uh, for the uh, MX model, you can see that these three classes in the blue ellipse um, are no more, more isolated than before. So the model is now able to make a better difference between the, those three classes. Now, if we come back and if you look at the red circle, um, you can see that for uh, there is three subclusters corresponding each one to one year of acquisition for RepSeed, uh, which means that this the representation learned by the model is now dependent of the meteorological conditions, um, which may explain the lack of generalizations of uh, the specialized model. But if we look now at the MX models, you can see that um, the RepSeed, uh, the cluster of RepSeed is now denser with interannual overlap. Um, which means that the learned representations are no less linked to the meteorological conditions and more to the semantic content of each class, which, uh, which uh, means that the model no learns more robust representations of the data. Now, uh, since we have shown the interest of using multi-year data, uh, we want to know um, how to leverage information uh, from previous years to maximize the performance at a given year. For that, we tested three different configurations. Um, first, our baseline, uh, where a model is trained on three years uh, without additional information, in re which in reality corresponds to the MX model that we have already seen. Uh, then we have the concatenation, concatenation of the observations. So here the model is trained on three years of cumulative data. Um, but for each parcel, we concatenate the two past years learned feature to the current uh, year learned feature. So, here, the, the, the model have a direct access to the two last years of, of observations to predict the current year's observations, the current year's labels. So. And finally, uh, we have the, the concatenations of the declarations. So here, the model is trained on three years uh, of cumulative data, but for each parcel, we concatenate the one-node encoded past declarations uh, to this year's learned feature. 
Um, so the model have a direct access to the ground truth of the two last year on top of having access to the observations of the current years to predict the current, the current label. So uh, our hypothesis will be that um, the contribution of the declarations um, contains all the necessary information, meaning that the classification is independent of the observations uh, conditioned to the declarations. And if we look at the results, we can see that the contribution of the declaration here um, allows us to gain 6.3% uh, MIOE points um, over 2020 compared to the MX model, which represents 7.7% uh, compared to the specialized models over 2020. Uh, the observation bypass also uh, increased uh, the result, but only by 0.6%. And uh, we've also tested a PCTA model um, with uh, internal rotation to modelize thanks to a conditional random field, which gets 72.3% uh, 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 MIU, which is better than the observations, but still under the declarations. Um, to, go further, to go further in the exploitations of the results, uh, we define three categories um, uh, among the 20 classes. So we have uh, permanent crops uh, for which the cultivated crop doesn't change upon years. So it's simple rotations like vine, 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 for instance. Um, then structured uh, crops where a few number of uh, rotations are used by a large majority of farmers. Uh, with uh, also simple rotations like corn, maize, cores, for instance, which represents seven classes among the, the 20 classes. And finally, we have uh, unstructured crops where um, a large variety of um, rotations are used. So we can observe a strong progression for crops with simple temporal structure with 16.8% uh, of uh, MU progressions uh, for the M declaration model compared to the MX model for permanent crops and 7.6 for structured crops, which represent a total of 70% of the studied parcels. But we'll see, have, uh, we also have more complex uh, temporal structures uh, extracted with 2.3% uh, of progressions uh, for unstructured crops here, which represent uh, half of the classes, the considered classes. So, um, in conclusion, we present a new state of the art model uh, for multi year parcel classification, and we show that the use of past uh, declarations is beneficial. The code is available on Git, um, and uh, the dataset is available on Zendo, which is the first ever multi year large scale annotated uh, parcel dataset. Uh, the paper has been accepted this morning to the special issue of remote sensing uh, advances in deep learning techniques for the analysis of remote sensing time series. And uh, by the way, uh, I'm looking for a PhD in deep learning applied to remote sensing or any related field. So um, if some of you are interested by a motivated student, uh, you can contact me at this address. Thanks for your attention. Uh, do we have any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, Felix. Um, so you, you limited your analysis to stable parcels. Can you tell us uh, uh, how much data did you discard to only keep uh, stable parcels? Um, um, we at the beginning we had uh, like uh, hundred thousand and uh, um, hundred and ten thousand uh, parcels, and uh, considering only stable parcels, um, um, with only stable parcels, but uh, I think it's like a uh, hundred and sorry, uh, hundred and sorry parcels uh, over uh, which are not stable. Uh, yeah. Okay. Not so most parcels are stable. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, you still need to use data from the target year to train the model, uh, which kind of prevents it to be used for in the actual operational setting of monitoring. What could be do to what could be done to to improve that? Uh, can you repeat this? So you still need to use data from the target year to train your model. Yeah. Uh, it kind of prevents it to be to your model to be applied in an operational setting for the uh, monitoring. What could be done to to improve uh, this weakness? Um, um, we can work on uh, early classification. Uh, the, um, this can be adapted to early classification uh, uh, model, which uh, will allow, uh, allow us to um, uh, work with data with um, with data that are not uh, already labeled, and, uh, which will be uh, which will uh, allows us to use uh, farmers' declarations uh, to to monitor crops before farmers' declarations. So in, in the, in the same uh, the same 
question by Joachim Niebo, who asked, uh, when you train the model with uh, two different tiers, did you evaluate the performance for a year not seen during the training? Uh, you mean during testing? Uh, I so was the model, uh, basically, was there a setting where you trained the model on some years and evaluated on all the years that were not seen during training? No. Uh, we, have not done, we, we haven't done that because uh, we lack of, uh, there is a lack of data, so, but it will be done uh, since uh, 2020 uh, data will be available. So that's something which is planned to be done, but we, have done, we haven't done it since we have only three years of acquisition uh, from 2018 to 2010. Right, uh, because Sentinel-2, we only have full years for since 2018, and yeah. so to, to do temporal adaptation with only two years from another year, it doesn't work at all. Like Felix said, hopefully, hopefully, as the years pass, it will become easier and, uh, and easier. Um, okay, well, uh, thank you a lot, Felix, and thank you to all the speakers and to all the participants who uh, spent the entire morning with us. Um, I will uh, splice the recording together, and hopefully soon I will upload to YouTube uh, the entirety of this presentation. So if you want to share it uh, with colleagues who are not able to attend, feel free to do that. And um, again, thank you, everybody. And bon Thanks. Goodbye.